Yeah, now it'll be awkward. Welcome to the Top Movement Podcast, episode 16. We are, we, the, you know, this is, this is a monument episode, I feel. This is one of those episodes where it, it, it's going to be a little bit important looking back because the bourbon that we're trying today wraps back around to when we kind of harvested this idea and really started thinking about going on this journey together. True. Which is True. which is pretty cool. But before we get to that, how's y'all's week been? Uh, just so y'all know, anybody watching, I was not making weird faces at Eric. I was making weird faces because I can hear myself breathing in my mic. Mm. And I was like, oh, I hope y'all don't hear that. I would Monitoring be awkward. is great. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, who's breathing heavily? Who's... Oh, oh that's you. me. Whoops. You ever work out so hard you can hear your heartbeat? In your body, oh, uh, dude! Like, I, yeah. Your hands can hear your heartbeat. You ever have that? The worst is when your jawbone starts to uh, like thump up on with your thump. heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Oh man, it's never a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> now, what is that? Oh, go ahead. Go I ahead, was just gonna man. say the absolute worst mm -hmm. is when you get the dry cough. You've worked out so hard that you dry <laughs> cough for like. Three or four days afterwards. I think that's just you, Eric. I'm no, 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 no. That's like a thing. It, oh, it's really? it's like onset rhabdo, essentially. It, oh. it, it's you've deprived your body of oxygen or something like that. My sister explained it to me one time. She's she's the nurse slash mm -hmm. doctor person of the family, essentially, and <laughs> some set of Sorry. things happens. And you just start coughing. Interesting. And to you give, just um, can't stop. To give Eric's sister some credit, early on in her medical career, when she was, I think, an EMT or a nurse or something like that, she had to come over to my house because Eric split his forehead open because Eric swam into the side of the pool. In Eric's defense, these crazy HOA people fault. painted the wall of the pool blue so it doesn't it's like an invisible wall you can't see it i don't know it. how you motherfuckers made it through childhood right <laughs> honestly <laughs> i Dude, honestly no, don't Nat, get it Nat, there was no wall for all intents and purposes if you were wearing goggles and you went into the water here mm -hmm. the wall disappeared it looks like you're in the ocean oh the wall God. is indistinguishable from the water at the yeah. pool that we used to sp swim at. It's nuts. And Stupidity. so Eric's uh, mom and sister come over to pick him up, check on him. And he's like, he's like lightheaded, sit on the couch, dizzy. And his sister walks up to him and it's like a big thing right here. And she takes her fingers and tries to spread it open. Yeah. <laughs> and Eric's like, whoa. And he wakes up and she's oh. like, he's fine. <laughs> oh my gosh, guys. <laughs> I, I have to go first because the craziest thing happened this week. Wait, wait, wait. Before you do that, I, I, I put pizza in before and I, I was baking it for my wife. Give me one second. And Nat! Be right. I you, know, you, I know. We it was started. Like, it literally we were, lighting up at the worst time. The record, I have filters already off, so I can't hear I'm going to have to cut I... this out. How dare he? <laughs> what a pizza man. Oh, wait, my no, that's gosh. supposed to be me. God, I hope y'all don't hear this stuff. I'm trying to fix my mic. We're all over the place. Do you, do you ever just do DiGiorno pizza? anymore i don't remember the last time i had to join a pizza i might have had one in the past six months but uh we actually always go with certain pizzas like um lately it's been the mustache pizza it's really cool because you can get a cardboard mustache out of it um but the thing is certain pizzas i'll eat it and i'll have the normal response like oh you're just not gonna have a great day the next day but like yeah. Oh, there's a lot of pizzas that it's like a terrible day the next day uh so stuff like hunt brothers and the mustache pizza and i can't remember what we used to get in georgia it's like it doesn't kill you it doesn't make yeah, you feel I, like you're gonna die i feel like whenever you go into a new pizza place they should just have you sign a waiver at that point like, it, like it's on the same level of risk i feel <laughs> it really is like the biggest one for me is the oil factor there are certain pizzas <laughs> that will oh dude they're the worst they will make me like 
sweat oil within an hour and it feels disgusting yeah when your pizza turns into an oil soup halfway through eating it you went to the wrong pizza place man you made a mistake oh yeah there's there is a really cool youtuber not youtuber well she's probably on youtube uh twitch streamer i'm gonna find her i can't remember her name off the top of my head but she does she owns or started a pizza place and they stream on twitch i think it's called like pizza princess or something like pizza that princess oh, yeah I'm or princess pizza princess but pizza it, it's pretty cool um you know you you would think That's that cool. twitch would just show you like your no. recent the people no. that you follow you when you no. search for something it doesn't do a good much. job of that yeah sort of that from that platform Oh. The funny thing is they started doing these like stories and when I open it up on my phone, I see them immediately hmm. because they have a story. Ooh. On that note, uh, man, do Eric, I have a story for, for y'all. What do you got? So this past weekend, we went, played volleyball. Typical weekend, we were going out for like five or six hours, play some volleyball. This time we were trying out a new field. Because the field near us has been doing a lot of events lately where there's just a bunch of kids and not a lot of space and all this kind of stuff. So we were like, hey, let's not do the normal field. Let's go to this other field. This other field has at least 10 soccer fields worth of space in two separate sections. So we knew that we were going to be able to go and play volleyball. there. So we go. We play volleyball and it is Easter Sunday. So no one was there, right? What time? N- no one was there. No one was there. It was a wonderful day. We played volleyball. It was loads of fun. Me and my wife are heading home. And this is a new route for us because we're at a new park. So we're heading home and we're going down these roads. And in front of me, We're in a two lane. There's us going one way and the opposing traffic coming the other way. And on the side of the road, right in like the gutter area, I see a bike. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have to go around that bike. That's really weird. We get close to the bike and I'm making sure, so I'm looking up and to my left. I'm no longer looking at the bike because I know I'm going around it. I'm making sure there's no oncoming traffic. We are now close enough to the bike and my wife is like, I think there's a kid under that bike. I'm like, oh shit, but we're passing by this bike at this point. I'm like, okay, I got to turn around. Over. Yeah. At this point, this like kid or bike has not moved. So I'm like, okay, this could be bad. This could so be bad. we go <laughs> and we couldn't pull over fast, fast enough. And there was like oncoming traffic. So I pull into the next driveway, turn around. And then we pull into this store right in front. We get out of the car, we run. And there's an old guy trapped under this bike, blood pooling underneath him i'm like holy shit we're we're in critical mode okay i'm like b make sure he doesn't move i'm like calling 911 we're on the phone i'm talking to the guy i'm like we were passing by this road we're in the corner of this that i had already scoped out where the signs were i knew where to look we were fine with that regard i was like here's where we are we're exactly in front of this store they're like cool i'm gonna get while I'm talking to this guy, this guy is now becoming conscious. He is out of his mind and he doesn't speak English. Oh, he's delirious and he's uh, yeah. ESL. Rough, rough yeah. spot. Okay. He is now trying to get up. I'm like, no. You can't, stop, sir. Stop. Stop. Just sit down. He's like, oh, no. Uh, not saying anything comprehensible. I'm like, oh my God. I need this guy to chill. At this point... There, we now see the blood pooling behind his head. I'm like, is this guy still bleeding? His, his, the back of his head is all bloody. Matting. He's got like a cap yeah. on. I'm like, oh my gosh. How's B doing? What are we doing? Uh, you know, she hasn't dealt with a huge ton of high stress scenarios. Mm-hmm. And so she's trying to, you know, pick up and help this guy. I'm like, we just need this guy to sit down. We need he him to, to sit. Still. And still, and we need to just keep talking to him so he stays conscious. Because if he goes, if he and goes unconscious, he's going to go into shock. Yeah, it, it's yeah. just we don't want him to go unconscious. We just want to keep him talking. But he doesn't speak English, and he does not want help at this point. Now he's like trying to push B away. 
this guy's trying to walk and like move Bro. away from us, but he, he can't, he can't walk. Like the guy is actively falling. So now I'm holding his full weight in one arm while trying to make sure this guy isn't like, do I need to just put this guy on the ground and like have him be still? How bad is his head right here? Mm -hmm. Luckily, he finally just falls on his ass. And I'm like, perfect. Just stay. Just stay. And once he once he was sitting down, we were like, okay. And then another guy pulls in. Luckily, this guy speaks Spanish and starts talking to the oh, dude. Solid. But the guy, the, the two guys speaking Spanish to each other, the guy's like, I don't really know what he's saying. I'm like, oh, God, this is not good. Uh, he's in a bad spot. Incomprehensible, yeah. And... At this point, we we think he was super drunk. We don't really know what happened, but the guy that's talking to him in Spanish is trying. To, now the police arrive, and the police instantly are like, "Who hit him?" We were like, "Whoa, <laughs> not us, not us." <laughs> let's 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 put that on the table right now. We did not hit him. I have footage from my car that can prove this point, right? So. They're talking to us, and then they finally get it from him, and he just fell, right? He wasn't hit, and he was just delirious. They think he was drunk, and the cops are like, thank you so much. And then we go on our way, and we're going home. But, man, it was the weirdest set of events to occur exactly in the order that they did. It was just That's so why you so don't odd. change your schedule. Because the world throws curveballs at you. <laughs> I was a curveball, man. I have I have not had to deal with a... So when I was going to college, and obviously these guys know, but for the audience, I used to do a lot of lifeguarding and training for life and getting all the different certificates and like trying to get EMT certificates and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and I've dealt with a number of, you know, people diving and going unconscious in the water and those types of scenarios but i haven't had to deal with that in over 10 years now so this i was like what are we doing why are we here oh why are we back here? why are we drunk why were why were we drunk on a bicycle guys please sir gentlemen and, the and with that yeah the dude the ambulance time was they were they were on point they i think it to, was I think they four, minutes. four minutes yeah was insane. They were there quick. I think uh, by the way, Nat, you you say they're supposed to be four to eight minutes. Uh, not in Atlanta, my dude. They're supposed to. <laughs> I didn't say that they're going to be. I said they're supposed to be four to eight minutes. But, but yeah, they were super quick. They were super quick, and Sick. they were checking them out. He was sitting up, conscious, and talking when we left. I'm hoping that it was also. Good, well after that. Hope so. That's but, wild. Yeah, it was it was wild. Interesting time was to wild. be alive, Anthony. Hello. <laughs> what do you got, yes. bud? I'm last today. What? Oh man. Okay. So let's see. Last weekend was a little nuts because I drove to Georgia, to Tennessee, and back to North Carolina. Um, Woo! Yeah, went to a black belt test, which was the biggest hapkido black belt test we've ever had uh never seen so many black belts in one room and so many people who can kill in one stroke yeah <laughs> we got a new uh fifth degree which makes her a master she uh did incredibly it was awesome uh she lives in australia now um we also had our first student from australia test for third degree they were a third degree in taekwondo so they uh learned our art in like less than a year and were able to test to it so it was pretty impressive uh at one point she was doing uh what we call black area wrestling um with like two opponents and so basically anything goes just don't permanently damage your opponent right so you can go for an eye gouge but don't actually gouge their eye out that would be bad um well she wait, didn't know the rules. Wait, no, 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 no. Like, you ran I, over that like that was normal. Hold on, hold on, hold on, no, 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 no. You can't just pretend to do an eye gouge. It's called an eye gouge. What are you going to eye pet them and go like, oh, no, oh, so, oh, oh, God. Oh. No. Now, next that's time not how person, it works. We can wrestle a little bit and I'll show you. Uh, no, you're not going <laughs> to wrestle me. 
None of you are going to wrestle me. <laughs> you can explain right now what the fuck's going on. So it depends on the situation that you're in. If it's a very high intensity level of situation, you're pushing next to their eye, right? You're not touching their eye because if they move too fast, they could gouge their own eye. But in some situations, you are literally just like touching their eye and, and okay. they're like, oh, you know, okay. once your eye is touched, you're like, stop. <laughs> Like yeah, get off of yeah, me! You're like like you, there's you have a proper a, reaction, right? I have, is there's a I have a wife reaction? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So uh, yeah, feel free to ask any questions. Sorry, I'm very much. Nor- it's very normalized to me. But um, two people at the same time. She was doing two people at the same time. The fifth one had to do three. That was fun. Uh, and and the people aren't yeah. just people. They're like all, at least first degree black belts. I think everyone knows actually a second. Or a third degree black belt that they were so having to. So everybody's worth their spit. Yeah. Yeah. And wow. so the name of the game in that kind of situation is often just survive. survive. Like don't die, right? If you if you don't die, you've effectively saved yourself enough time that someone's probably going to come and interact with the okay. situation, right? Uh, but sometimes you win, and that's fun. Well, the girl that or woman that used to do or still does taekwondo from Australia, she doesn't know all the rules, and so in her first fight. She's managing the two fighters, and eventually she gets away from them and stands up and, like, is like, okay, well, screw you guys. Like, I'm out of here. And then the Grandmaster, he's like, yeah, yeah. so that was pretty good. Uh, usually we just kind of have a rule where you stay on the ground. And she's like, okay, I'll stay where the danger is. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> she got oh, sassy with it. <laughs> the whole room busted out because it was like, that's a really great point. Why would you stay where no, the danger is? This it's is a valid dumb. point. <laughs> it's a bad rule. <laughs> it's not a bad rule. It's just uh it's actually more of a safety rule because if someone stands up, it's easy to like knee someone in the face and whatnot. Um so yeah, that was fun and exciting. And then the next day, uh probably since I held some little babies on Friday night, so we're now we're on Sunday on my birthday. Um we traveled to Tennessee to go see the Fall Out Boy concert. And Let's go! I, I, yeah, which was great. And uh, Car is so hot and cool. cool. Uh-huh. Car is the best. And I was really sad that she and they were only on for 15 minutes. Uh, but I got a signed album by them. Car, C A R R. Go check them out. Okay. They are pretty awesome. Um, and then, so okay. that was their opener. Hot Mulligan was on after that. Hot and. Mulligan. Okay, so I th- I found that Hot Mulligan, you need like really good speakers or to see them in person because they are screamers. And on low level volume speakers, you just don't get the, the awesomeness yeah. of their screaming. Uh, and it was really impressive because not only was there a main singer that did the screaming, but the like lead guitarist, I think, was also screaming. And at one point, the main singer unplugged his freaking mic on accident by spinning around in circles. And so then the guitarist had to make up for, or had to like do his lines basically. That's um, pretty dope. Yeah, so those guys were great. And then I can't remember who was third. They're they're really big, but like to me, they only have like three awesome songs, and then they're kind of like, eh, it's just not <laughs> what I care for. Uh, it was Jimmy Eat World. Um, so wait, yeah, you, you brushed off J- Jimmy Eat World, sir. So they have some good songs, and the and it was they really have they some good songs, so- sir. I like them. I just didn't like them in that lineup. It was just it was a very different like vibe. <laughs> but That's in my broken. defense, they were Fallout Boy before the, there was a Fallout Boy. But okay. Go in ahead. My, go in, go off, King. Go off. In King. my defense, before we went to the concert, I was like almost not going to make it because of how sick I had gotten. Oh. And then I did some things to try to like use adrenaline and whatnot. And you know the intensity of Car and Hot Mulligan were great and kept me going. And then we went and had a snack. And then Jimmy World was just too chill. They were so chill. I'm just sitting there. I was just like, my sickness was like getting worse and worse and like this sucks i gotta make it like two out two and a half more hours because you know fall out boy's gonna be two hours and then you know fall out boy gets on and they bring the energy back to the room and they were just so intense that i was still sick but i was not nearly like dying in my chair anymore i was able to stand up for like most of it 
the so. Jimmy World fan in me is like, oh, Jimmy World knew that Fallout Boy was headlining, so they didn't come with all their bangers. But like, this is me speaking Maybe. to all of the Jimmy World listeners that we may have watching or hearing or listening right now. They slap. Like, they are so good and very hype. But yep. you know what? I'm gonna no. step back from my. I'm gonna step back from my pedestal because I love Fallout Boy. So too. the problem. So I one get of it. the problems is, and I tried not to do this. We went and saw Fallout Boy like six months ago, but the drummer, which I think is Ashley, my wife's favorite, wasn't there because he had a family emergency, and so another drummer from royal and the serpent who's also amazing the entire band's amazing he learned all their songs in like a week and he played and he did incredibly it was awesome but the uh people that played right before fallout boy for that concert was um oh i'm gonna draw a blank it's not so there was royal and the serpent and then there was ah well it's okay it's okay you tried brain fart i'll have it at some point but because (laughs) of their like style and awesomeness it's just such a different vibe that i wasn't looking forward to um jimmy eat world it was bring me the horizon who are like have a very different style and they're really cool wait jimmy eat world Versus bring me, bring me the horizon i prefer bring, bring me, the, me horizon the horizon and fallout boy were on the same <laughs> no, no 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 Last year on their first tour, Fallout Boy, uh, Bring Me the Horizon was oh, with yeah. them. Oh yeah, two different vibes. Yeah. Okay. All yeah, right. I'm with you. And, I'm with and you. that was so awesome. And then when I started listening to Jimmy World, I was like I like their stuff, but the the vibe is so different. The weird thing is for the set that I saw, if they had done uh, Jimmy World, then Car, then Hot Mulligan, I think that would have been a better progression of styles. And in terms of like not having like a hype up and then down and then hype back up it was just jimmy the horizon jimmy in the horizon wow. jimmy the horizon jimmy e world it's just more chill and there's nothing wrong with that it was just like it was just different that's the crossover event we really need out oh of this man thing. i would love jimmy the horizon oh my god that would be so jimmy good Jimmy the horizon that would be nuts but yeah if y'all haven't listened to royal and the serpent or car oh my god you're missing out they are What's so it? great so great yeah i got a, i think it's i can't remember said i got a signed um record from oh, car good for you, man. she didn't sign it in person but there was like a collection of signed ones i'm looking um, forward to this car this car individual because i don't really get band rec was recommendations from either of you dude they're so fun and mm-hmm. they actually sang a song that they had came out with like two days ago two days before let's go i mean now yeah. i listen to obscure stuff you really do <laughs> you are the artsy like kid who went to art school and came back uh, changed and like listens to like woodwinds on the scottish hills yeah. of the 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 lock in yeah Drop not d yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dang it. Oh. a lot of people i mean i like normal bands too but i don't typically go listen to normal bands while i work or in my free time and i don't listen to music typically when i'm driving a car i usually listen to audiobooks and things like that so just listening to normal bands, I just don't quite get the time for that as often as I used to. So I tend to listen to avant-garde weirdness uh, while I work and other stuff and then po- podcasts or audiobooks. So I'm, the, I'm, I'm so surprised that I'm probably the only person who fits the listening uh, demographic for what I listen to out of this entire podcast, out of the two people who are here. By the way, I listen to mostly prog and uh, um, metal core. So, like, I'm the metal guy. Out of these two people, especially the guy with the beard and the long hair, I'm the one who listens to the heavier stuff. <laughs> yeah, anyway, that's nuts. That is so, funny. Last thing about it to articulate like the difference for those that don't know in Jimmy Eat World when they would pause the lead singer would talk and he kept doing a bunch of basically uh, imposter syndrome talking where they were like, you know, not 
being they're not awesome they're like you know it's it was weird um okay. it was a little it was a little odd it was like instead of like hyping up and stuff it was like you know thanks for letting us be here you know we're so old and stuff like that and i was just like okay bro you don't need to say that uh <laughs> on the other end of the spectrum spectrum uh bring me the horizon lead singer freaking went all the way out into the field and all around the crowd singing going nuts just oh, like doesn't give a fuck and it was nuts yeah, Ollie it, does not give and he hyped fuck. up Fall Out Boy so much oh, yeah. like he they was like the, the biggest wingman they... ever and it, you just can't beat that level of just it's, it was just so cool it was so hyped and and so so good but yeah Fall Out Boy was of course amazing and there was a lot of fire and we could feel it because uh, we were decently close and uh, yeah Fantastic highly recommend dude. if if, if they come near you for the tour their second tour okay you should see them okay well worth it and if you want to get warm get some seats that are really close <laughs> pyrotechnics because they have a lot of pyrotechnics oh. the freaking oh, lead the lead writer and but he does not the lead singer he uh Patrick he's Stella. like a he's got a oh pete Wentz. pyro guitar or pyro bass i can't remember if it's guitar or bass pete Wentz. yeah Dude, he's nuts. He, he's a magician. Like, he did some magic tricks. It was nuts. Hmm. Makes I sense. don't know how. He, like, disappeared at one point, reappeared somewhere else, and then he disappeared from there and reappeared really far away really quickly. Hmm. Dude, and, he probably has the rail system back there where, he, like, he jumps into something and he goes, whoop. Dude, how cool would that be? Oh, man, now I want to be, cool. like, where you're just, like, you're running, but also it's accelerating you really fast. Oh, no, like, you get into, a, like, a rail car and it goes, like, shoop. And it, like takes you immediately. The only thing is, it's not that safe for your problem. instrument. I'm rambling. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, he might have had a backup instrument there, but yeah, it's very possible. That's what I've been up to. And then for the past several days, we haven't been able to have a podcast because I've been sick. <laughs> um, well, are you feeling? I'm glad you're feeling better. Oh yeah, I'm well, like. Are you feeling better? I'm like 95. percent Took it easy today just to make sure that I'm 100 percent tomorrow. We're gonna round up to perfect. I feel. Basically, yeah, we'll get good there. enough. My throat is fine, and that's what matters. Nice. That's what we need. I can speak. That's what we need. All right, now, what have you been up to? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, pretty much same thing as before, except I am now employed. Nice. I have a job. I was waiting on Congrats. an answer from an interview from a while ago with the same district that I was in, in before. And this was going to be my kind of like standby job for me to go ahead and still get income while prepping my trans transition into cybersecurity. And it worked out. I got the nice. job. I Congrats. no longer have to worry about like free falling or anything like that. So I'm super stoked. Um, now you can like coast a little bit more and take it easier and feel less stressed and put m more impactful time into the career mm -hmm. shift. Very much so, because right now, because yeah. I was, it was between getting this job or losing a lot of sleep and hours to getting ready to yeah. get whatever I could get. Like, yeah. And I didn't want to be in that situation where I was just like, li I will literally take anything, because I knew yeah. I would probably get stuck with something that wouldn't be good for my, for growth purposes yeah and then you feel like you don't have any negotiating power yeah. and you just get screwed over and you take something less than what you're worth instead mm -hmm. of looking at it level-headedly yeah so i get a pay raise uh nice. my work is now 20 minutes from my house that's oh. versus an hour there we go and are you already doing that no when okay. you start, I'm already com I was already commuting for an hour back and forth. So I start either, and this is the kicker. So oh. for the school that I do work for, I would not be finishing the the year with them. I would be leaving next Monday, or the Monday after, and we are about to start standardized testing. And I am the one who runs the tech rollout for that. So. They have a bit of a learning curve ahead of them. I was about to say, it's you got to do what you got to do. It's going to be a rough time. So you're starting in like a week or two weeks. Is that right? I start in like either I start in like a few days or I start oh, in, sorry. In, in a week. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's Thursday, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I was about to say. I took some time off for my birthday and whatnot, and I totally we lost track of it. <laughs> and I was sick. Yeah. So I'm just like, it's what a day rough is time it? For everybody out here, my guy. So I also uh, went to a total wine down here in Texas. And let me tell you how much of a mistake that is for people who are into bourbon. It's a problem. There are. There are local based distilleries that have released single bar, single barrel select options for the uh, location. So you can pick up a city based single barrel select for Heaven's Door right now. Yeah, that's pretty typical. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. typical. Well, so yeah. this I'm new to this. So if if that's common, great. Now I know that I can't go to Tola Wine unless like I plan on buying just one <laughs> bottle and one bottle only because I went in there and they had one of these, one of these, yep. and Too like silent. six four squares. They're just like yeah. racked back to back. And then I uh, I texted these guys. I texted Eric and, I, and Anthony. I was like, is this – what's the MSRP on Foursquare? Because I remember it being way out of my price range whenever we talked about it at first. And he, they were both like, oh, that's oh that's super cheap. That's way low. And I was yeah. like, well, do I pick this, the Goose Island, or do I pick the Foursquare? And now that I've had the Goose Island, I understand you saying like the sweeter it's the sweeter bill. Yeah. I will still be getting the Foursquare. I'll yeah, be going nice. back probably in like the next few days and get the Foursquare. The Foursquare is just such a solid whiskey. The only thing that's interesting about the Foursquare is that, and we'll, we'll kind of transition into our mm-hmm. bourbon talk a little bit, but Bardstown actually ended up overproducing their Foursquare, it looks like, just a little bit. And because the MSRP is pretty high, you're not going to see the price of that drop down a great deal. So what you're having is the four square is actually the one of the series that has come off the shelf the slowest for Bardstown. But it's arguably one of their better ones, Would which is it's almost like a flagship now. Or no, I no, it's not going to be a flagship just because of the way that Bardstown does releases yeah the, okay. how they do their series it's just it's not going to be a flagship for them Bardstown is going to start releasing more and more of their bourbon and that's going to be their flagship and what they're going to end up doing just and this is purely conjecture for the audience right i i have no insider knowledge of Bardstown. i'm just guessing because of how i know they work Bardstown really likes to be do these cutting edge finishings in blends. I think very soon Bardstown is going to stumble into a very tasty, cheap blend that they do with their own bourbons, but different bourbons that they produce. That is going to end up being their flagship outside of their four year bourbon that they're already releasing. But you have to remember, Bardstown is a super new up and comer. Um, so they, they just started releasing an actual bourbon. Like they're really new to all of this. So we haven't really seen what their flagship is going to be. Instead, what they have focused on is the series. And they have a few different series, right? So they have the Origin series, the Discovery series, the Collaborative series, the Distillery Collection, and the Fusion series. And all of them have different ideas behind them. Most of them, they take different bourbons from other people and they bring them together and blend them into something that just tastes really, really nice. True. And so, funnily enough, we talk about all the Bardstown stuff. We're actually trying a Bardstown today. And this is, as I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, super special because 
we started this whole idea of this podcast really at my bachelor party in Kentucky. And we met a wonderful gentleman during that trip that we ended up talking to, I think, for, I don't know, a, a few hours at least, honestly. Yeah. Gregory. Yeah. Gregory. And he works with, I always forget, Vola, the, Vola Guitars. Guitars. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. please go go give him a, a follow, a shout out. Let him, let him know Taylor send music. him your way. Uh, yeah. We'll put it in the tags. Yeah, I'll I'll link all of his stuff. He is well worth a follow. Um, awesome dude. Really, yeah, really super cool, talented. Super talented, and he I think, believe he's a spokesperson for Volo. So for anybody who's yep. looking to buy a guitar and is wanting a little bit more of a personal experience, reach out to him. Yeah, he's dope. I'll talk you over. I'll, I'll bury your ear about the contortionist and everything. Yeah, it's great. And so we we ended up talking to him for a good deal, and Bardstown came up, and he actually said one of his favorite bourbons at that point in time when we talked to him was part of the collaborative series by Bardstown but one that wasn't being made anymore and so Bardstown goes through they release all of their stuff they get it out to shelves they distribute it once it's gone it's it's gone. gone right you have to find it in the aftermarket now luckily a good friend of mine who I'm sure we'll have on the podcast at some point he wants to come on and talk about bourbons with us Although he has explicitly stated he might not be the most up to date with the gaming sphere, but he plays a lot of board games and he, mm. he said he's in for some board game discussion. Okay. But he actually has a friend who owns a store and he collects Bardstown whiskeys and he loves them. So he has every single Bardstown that has been released. Fully stocked, like full bottle mm, and everything? Not fully stocked, quote unquote. Okay. Okay. So they're mostly part of his own collection. Okay. And so it's hard to get him to sell some of the older ones, but makes sense. You know, if you're part of his special crew, he may get you one. And so he ended up selling one of the Bardstown Ferrans, which I'll get, I'll get here in camera. Beautiful bottle, That's by the way. Bardstown bottle. always has a wonderful bottle. I will say so Anthony's pretty. gonna hate this bottle the most out of so any pretty. Bardstown. This would this bottle was created before they started doing the breakdown of the mash bill. So this is a no. Bardstown bottle. You you can see it doesn't actually have a mash bill on it. Disgusting. I've known Eric for too long. Like right when he was pulling it away, I was about to ask. It's like what, I know. Wait, what about the other side of it? Does it show the thing? And he just immediately knows. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Now, funnily enough, that doesn't mean they don't have it. They do have it on their page. So the oh, Bardstown Ferrand is a blend of seven and 11-year-old Kentucky bourbons aged in Mason Ferrand cognac barrels for Ooh, eight months. Cognac? Cognac barrels. Now, these seven and 11-year uh, bourbons, I have heard, are actually... The seven year, if I remember correctly, I believe is a Heaven's Hill product, a seven year bourbon from Heaven's Hill. And the 11 year is a wild turkey uh, bourbon. Now, not 100%, they might be flip flop. None of these are public facing things. I think I heard it when I was doing some Word research enough. and I found a, found a guy who had been to the distillery and apparently that's what he heard from somebody there. So take that with a grain of salt. It could just be MGP or something like that, but I think it's a heaven's hell and a wild turkey. And then it's aged in cognac barrels. Dude. Now, this is one of the favorites of the collaborative series. And so I am I am super excited to try this one out. I, I'm actually going to go I'm ahead gonna, and pour mine. I'm going to wash my glass because I was drinking oh. the uh, goose uh, goosehead one, and now it's contaminated, and I don't want the oh. chocolate to get into the Ferrand. So yeah, right. right? Blah, blah, you can't blah, 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 blah. you can't taint the the bottle here. I made sure not to pour the whole bottle this time. <laughs> oh, so you can save some from late for later. No snorting whiskey today. Oh. Or bourbon. It's unfortunate. Mm. Oh, okay. So now that Nat's back, 
right. Yeah. I didn't want to right, 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 do right. the. You didn't want to do the nosing before <laughs> all noses were present. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Oh nice. wait. Oh wait. No, we. I don't know. Whatever. Um, I didn't want to mention before because I didn't want to interrupt <sighs> the introduction, but I will be going to the Bardstown Tasting Room this weekend. Oh, oh in Kentucky? Yeah. Oh, in, nice. yeah, in Louisville. Um, that yeah. and getting my own, like, bullet custom labeled thing, apparently. Oh. And, of course, going back to Stitzel and Weller. So we might get to see Greg. Might Let's actually go. get to eat there. Nice. Um, and I can't remember what else. My wife's planning it. So, uh, these guys might know, but Fall Out Boy is... I like Fall Out Boy, obviously. But that's like my wife's band. So, mm. on my birthday, we did something my wife really wanted to do. Because that was the day that they were close. Um, and so, this weekend... Mm, mm, mm. Cheers. Yeah. cheers! 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 This guy... To getting older. <laughs> to getting older. Like fine oh, bourbon. Man, that's exciting, though. That's exciting. Yeah, yeah, and then we're gonna top it all off by watching the first solar eclipse we've ever seen. Yeah, that'd be dope. Ooh. Which is why we're going up there, because it's like, yeah, it's very close to the solar eclipse. That lit my mouth on fire. Yeah, so this is actually a 55 proof, uh, or sorry, a 110 proof bourbon, by the way. So 55% ABV. Did not know. <laughs> it's a it's a pretty hot bourbon. Now this mm. on the, the nose, on I the get back. yeah, I get a lot of like nuttiness combined, almost like a trail mix on the nose, right? I get like raisins, figs, like dried fruits type of mm-hmm. deal yeah. with nuts, and then on when when you taste it, man, that's that's got this on point. You get like cinnamon. It's a lot mm-hmm. of spices, baking spices. Mm-hmm. Maybe clove. Mm. I can't taste it though because oh. I like the my mouth. The me chewing it, I wanted to like. Yeah, it was it. It was hard. It, <laughs> but I'll just yeah. say that it was hard. It's got a it's got a nice tasty heat on it. The heat, and I will say the nose kind of transitions to the flavor for me. I get some nuttiness. I get some of those dried fruits with this broad spectrum spices mm-hmm. wrapped. Like you get some nuts and dried fruits, and then you wrap them in a blanket of a cinnamon, Spice. cloves, baking spices type of deal. Oh, man, definitely baking spices. For anybody yeah. like me who really struggles to smell stuff, you got to get one of these Sensing tasting goods. bourbon tasting kits this is what eric got me for my birthday a few years ago oh. and oh man so i was really struggling to smell i was doing the technique i couldn't smell anything i was just getting a lot of acetone nat said clove i saw clove right here mm. i smell it and now i can't not smell it like it's so it's, it's really there yeah yeah so thank you so, nat and thank you eric you're welcome <laughs> i can taste this barrel yeah, it's got it. So there is this, the tail end mm-hmm. has this hot cinnamon, mm-hmm. almost like it reminds me of a red hot mm-hmm. with a little bit of, with like a dark wood flavor. Yeah. At the tail end. Much. That dark wood flavor is definitely what I'm picking up on. Yeah. The cinnamon is obvious. And then the clove um, is there. I'm struggling to get the fruits on the t- on the tongue. It's it for me. It's right at the beginning. So it okay. kind of like you get nuts and fruits right at the start, and then that immediately, immediately after warmth. you get that warmth yeah. and woody flavors. Mm. It mm. smells fant. It smells really good. It's just like you have to be ready for that uh, that alcohol, man. That's, and it's gonna it's gonna mess with your nose for a little bit. Hey, Greg, you knows how to some... choose a bourbon here, though, man. Say again, oh, Anthony. Yeah. Now, were you drinking anything before you tasted it? I did, and it was like pretty. Like the goose I had is literally like chocolate as a bourbon. Yeah, 
It's, That's what I got when I tried. Yeah, it. so it's I like a chocolate it. as a bourbon. It's very chocolatey. It's very, it's very chocolate forward, and like the cher- the cherry undertone is there too. But for, and it has affected this in the sense that these sweet tones that I would normally pick up on are a little muted because they're not as pronounced as the goose head. Yeah. So that is not something that you want to do when you are tasting bourbon. Do not go for a very high volume uh sweet bourbon and then go to something that's a little bit spicier and mellow and expect the same amount of of uh huh. sweet experience for anybody who doesn't who doesn't know the the taste buds that you have on your tongue they react very quickly and normalize flavors very quickly especially sweet flavors hmm. so if you have something that's super sweet your taste buds normalize, I think it's within five to 10 seconds. And then once you have something right after that, that next thing that you have is going to be a little bit less sweet. Yeah. And it takes things that are umami, salt-based, things of that nature to kind of counterbalance that and have those taste buds kind of reinvigorate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And it doesn't help that uh, beverage companies have increased the level of sweetness of your drinks mm. like year over year to make it taste better. And then people try like tea for the first time with some honey in it. And they're like, this is disgusting. It's like, yeah. well, if you stop drinking Coke for like a week, you might actually, okay. might actually yeah. like it, which happened to me. <laughs> this thing is yeah. making me warm, y'all. Dude, I my body temperature is up. Yeah, this is a wonderfully delightful bourbon. Mm. Oh, perfect time! I just thought about it um, because we were talking about Gregory. I thought about buying a guitar from him because um, I recently found out that there were some uh, there's a property or something that was being held at another house that we used to live in, and it was being returned by the state. So I got like seventeen hundred dollars back and i was like what am i gonna do with you seventeen hundred dollars greg listen here right here you and me if vola guitars wants to sponsor tap haven podcast you and your company are the best guitar company on this planet (laughs) and i can guarantee that we'll sell your guitars or buy them one or the other a Tap Haven specific guitar sounds wonderful. <laughs> but But yeah, I I'm also in. I'm in I for also, that. I also recently sold my Telecaster of like seven, eight years, like a love American Deluxe, and I, it, I was like, I have so much guitar money. Mm-hmm. But I put I put it all in savings and I only bought one guitar, so we're we're safe. We're safe. That's a smart decision. But yeah. If you are in the market for guitars, Bola guitars, they're really nice. They look really nice. You're gonna, you're, for me, the headstock is always the hardest thing to nail down for a guitar, and it has to be unique enough that like I can re- recognize it from afar, but also not as not abstract enough that it alienates the rest of the body. Vola t- treads the line because of their interesting body design and headstock, so it's very exotic. It's really nice. Yeah. I am a sucker. Oh, well, I'm an addict, I should say, to ebony fretboards now. Mm. So mm. that's that's pretty much the only type of guitar I get anymore or even look at. If it doesn't have an ebony fretboard, I, I have trouble with it. I After playing on it for well over a decade You're stuck. R- rosewood and maple like all of those are just not roasted maple you can do ivory <laughs> no. No. no no you no. can't no, no you, you can't. can't you can't you can't you can't there and disappointed can't. so we're going to change the subject now anthony thank you <laughs> thank you for doing that <laughs> i appreciate it i appreciate it no uh, i was going to say no one ever I- made an ebony fretboard Ivory is that not a fretboard? I, ivory. They've Sorry, done ivory, rich, ivory. They've done a rich light uh white white board uh fretboard, but uh I've never seen an ivory I'm sorry. fretboard. Wait, is ivory white or black? 
Ivory is white. So, the, oh my god! The, so Eric loves ebony fretboards. Yes. yes. Wow. The, I I don't know how long I've had. I've always thought ebony, ebony was white and ivory was black. Ebon clover. I don't know Sorry, no, is. no. Evan he had it backwards. Not, never mind, never mind. Dude. I just always had it backwards. Okay, okay. No, you're right. You're right. Huh. Okay. So the, the problem with doing an ivory fretboard, I don't know if one exists. I, I'm sure somebody crazy somewhere has done it illegally nowadays, obviously. But And maybe synthetically you could do it. But even back in the day, the fretboard is all one solid thin piece of wood. It's put on top of whatever the guitar wood is. So they would have had to have a full thing of ivory, which obviously mm -hmm. you're you're not going to get from a tusk of no any sort that I, I know of. You're not going to get a straight cut of yeah. bone from any animal at this point in time to say that you're say, that you're getting an ivory fretboard you would yeah. have to have grown it in the lab specifically to go straight first and yeah. god knows what that would do to the actual composition of the yeah of the actual uh, bone so yeah. and would be severely illegal mm -hmm. <laughs> incredibly <laughs> illegal wild yeah. amount of poaching um so for this bourbon I'm it's going to be it's taking some time for me to get to know it. But in the time that I am getting to know it, the fire is not abating. Like it's a, like this is a whiskey that this is a bourbon that you drink whenever you are feeling as if you just need to like, you know, not need a fire on a winter's day cuz it will live inside you. This is this would be a wonderful winter bourbon. Oh, absolutely. Guys, you know why it's so great that we're having it today? Because it is April, and it is cold as today. shit. It, it snowed for me today, and it's supposed yeah, to snow more insane. tonight. Yeah, okay, I love it. Hurts. Yeah, okay. Same. Yeah, guess it's what? the mountains, man. Guess what? It's I lit a fire here. again today. How hot it's is hot. it over there? 72. It's, it is currently 82. Holy Jesus Christ. He's below the storm line. So for me, it was like 48 today or something. So you guys can all suck it 32. as I am now double the temperature from one of you. More than double me. Yeah, I was about to say, you're was, way up there. It was freezing temperatures last night, and today was 37 for most of the day. Earth is ghetto. I want to leave. Ah! So now, now that you're on date three. Date three how do you with this. how do you feel about that bourbon? Day three with you, this one. What would you pay for this? What would I pay for it? Yeah, what would you pay for it? Knowing what the Bardstown costs. No, 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 no. What would you pay for this? Pay for it. I want this to be objection, like your price. Don't think about it in terms of what you think it should cost or what the market thinks it should cost. I want to know what you would pay for it because people with your taste that go through this journey with us, our audience, when they come to you and they're like, my tastes follow gnats, they need mm, to know what you would fair. pay for. Okay. So honesty time. This yeah. is not in the flavor palette for me. Just going to okay. tell you straight up. Ah. Um, I would pay 90 for this. It would be a nice little holiday special thing. And you know, actually no, I would pay I'd pay one twenty five. I'd pay one twenty five. Because it's a nice little holiday bourbon. You bring it out every now and then for the holidays. It's a special time. It's supposed to feel special when you pour it. It's something that your dad will drink and he'll be like, Oh God, this makes this reminds me of the time and then he'll soliloquize soliloquize soliloquy soliloquize about his Life. About his life. About his life. But anyway, um, he'll mo he'll monologue about his life, and that's that's a great experience to have. It's just not one that you would have on the regular, and that's 
that kind of that's kind of what brings the price up for me, but also shortens the uh, review for it for me as well. So uh, lowers the number. Um, and what would you rate it? This is a. Because our the definition of it of our five being you can drink this every single day and it's fun every single time and you enjoy it, this is like a four point eight five. It is like if you are into this and you love this flavor palette, this is something that you're gonna want all the time. You can't afford it to, though, but it's something that you're gonna want all the time. Um Actually, not even like the afford it part. It's going to be really hard to drink this in the middle of summer. It's like scratch the money. If you drink this whenever it's hot outside, you're going to be miserable. <laughs> it's like you'll be sweating. Because you're going to be hot outside. You're going to be hot inside. You're going to take your shirt off. Your, 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 your lady or your husband is going to be like, why do you take your shirt off? And you're going to be like, you're not the boss of me. You're going to go outside and you're going to still have your shirt off and, and your significant other or whoever it is that you're, who you're with. Or maybe you're alone and it's just your animal or your imaginary friend. I don't know. I don't know your life. Anyway, you go outside and your shirt's off and it's still hot out there. There's just no relief for you. You can't escape. And that's the one thing that kind of like hangs up for me for this bourbon is that there is no escaping this heat. Like I am, I feel the heat here and I've never felt that with any bourbon. I feel it here. And it's like almost like an icy hot feel. I don't know, man. Strange reaction. Yeah. I'm Anthony, what would, you, what would you pay for this bourbon? What's well, your breakdown? Before that, because I'll, I'll forget. Uh, this entire time, I have wished that I could feel what Nat was feeling. And I realized at first, I think I was taking two small sips. So I started taking bigger sips. And it really started to light up my mouth a lot more and my throat. But it's not hitting me nearly as hot. I don't feel hot. Like, my headphones are warm, but that's always happening. So I kind of wish that was happening to me, too. Because, I don't know, that sounds cool. Uh, it, that's what I'm looking for in a bourbon sometimes. So at first, my first inclination was like 80 bucks. And also my rating was going to be like a 7 out of 10. But wow, when I started thinking about it... I kind of wish, and I might try to do this in the future. Um, so I've been having a little bit of Jefferson's Ocean before we started our tasting. And it's only 45% alcohol. So 90 proof. It's, it's very light compared to this, which is 55 proof. Or no, percent. Wow, that's such a hard thing to do. 110 It's proof. okay. I'm slurring too. I think this <laughs> thing kicks like a freaking mule. Yeah. But like the thing is... Jefferson's Ocean tastes like water compared to <laughs> this Bardstown for this for thing run. kicks, man. Yeah, and I love that. And so I had to try to remember what have I had recently that is, is strong. And what I got was something that I think is really cool, and it's Old Forester's Prohibition style. Their Prohibition style is 115 proof. It is literally what they served in 1920 for those who had medical licenses or medical whatever. It's just like for medical marijuana during prohibition. So this is me that is medicine bourbon, and I like it a lot because um, like I drink it, it and I'm a lot? I like it a lot. It, it's I can't remember the taste. I didn't like. I can't remember like the profile. It's just it's not. It doesn't make me not want to drink it. Right. I like it, and. But I don't remember like, oh, this is sweet or not sweet or something like that. Um, oh, before I forget, though, the reason I like it so much is because I can say, oh, I'm drinking my medicine when I have it. Oh, God. Because <laughs> it was literally sold as medicine back in the day. Um, uh. No joke, though. No joke. I will say, I don't know what happened. I ate something. It, I, My stomach was really upset. And I asked my wife to grab me some of that. I took a sip within like... 30 to 60 seconds, it went away. And I was like, it's because it killed it, Anthony. <laughs> yeah, which is great. Because it kills. Along with everything else. <laughs> everything else. It's yeah. called a purge. <laughs> Not a purge. It just killed the bad stuff. Anyways. So, in not being able to remember that that has any, like, 
flavor profile or anything like that. And the fact that this Ferran does have like a lot of sweetness and there's no like overpowering bitterness or anything like that. It's just, it's smooth, but very hot and very powerful. Uh, because of that, I actually, I'm going to give it like a mm, seven and a half out of 10. Mm. And I would That's say that to me, cause old Forrester prohibition style is worth or cost like $67 on caskers. Um, I would see this one easily being like 125. Not that I would want it to be 125. I want it to be like 80 bucks and then I actually buy it. If it was 125, I'd be like, maybe. <laughs> like that would, actually, I wouldn't be surprised if it was a lot more because four square is 160. And so like, I don't know. It's one of those things where it's hard for me to know if it's actually worth it to me mm. or the, if it's like up there in the price. And before I forget again, we can circle back to this, but since I'm going to be going to Stitzel and Weller for breakfast, I want to know, and this could be good for the audience to learn, how does that one thing they sell a day thing work? And should I, what do I need to know oh. before I go into that? So maybe oh, yeah. we talk about that in a second. <clears throat> so, let me let me let me do my yeah. rating just r- real quick because I this bourbon has something that we haven't seen in my opinion on the podcast yet, and that is a tasty burn slash warmth that comes back up. Mm. So when I first tried bourbon when I was a kid. This is an entirely biased thing. When he, when it was illegal. Well, yes. <laughs> when I was... Don't drink, kids. What the, what's the statute of limitations for this? Probably like five years. I should be okay. Probably, yeah, okay. When, yeah, well, when I was yeah, like okay there, bud. 18 and In I was with where it's legal. family uh, and they gave me a super super nice distillery collection of a middleton i tried this thing and it hit me and there was this irish whiskey shortbread and then it like goes down and it's hot but then it hits your heart and it starts radiating back Mm. up and i look for that in whiskeys now I look for that radiating heat that comes back up. This isn't quite there. But it's the first one on the podcast that starts to approach that. Yeah. But my number one criteria for what I consider great whiskeys that's in the Redbreast 27. It's in the Thomas H. Handy. It's in the, the, the Midwinter Dram. It's in some of my favorite whiskeys that I've had recently and in my life is a burn that is tasty. It doesn't just burn for the sake of burning. It has a burn with a flavor. Mm. We, I feel, in all of the episodes that we've done so far, have not been had a whiskey that did that. Some of them had a burn. Some of them had great flavors. Some of them were phenomenal. But they did not have a burn with flavor. This is the first one we've had that I feel that really has that. And that is one of the trademarks of my favorite whiskeys. Now, there are some things that aren't quite in my flavor palette for this one, which is why I think I also put this at an eight. Okay, I'm so glad you said that because that's what I wanted to say and that's why I said 7.5, but then you were saying all that stuff and I was like, that's what I was thinking, but I wasn't sure because my memory's terrible. And so I I already wrote down, actually, it's an 8 out of 10. I was just too scared to say it earlier. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, I wanted to say 8, but I I didn't want to be the first one. I it too hard and and Anthony got scared about it. I did. I did. I was like, like, I'm going to get hounded. Anthony, you said you were going to write it down so this shit did not happen. Happen. You Look, specifically man. said you're gonna write it down so I that you don't that do I'm it. Convincing man, I can't help it. And this is slightly better to me than last week's 
um, Australian whiskey, the Sol- the Solera. And mm, was it the Solera? Yeah. yeah, it was the Solera. It's slightly yeah. better than that for me. Mm-hmm. And that was a great whiskey. And so this this really solidifies it as the start of what I could, would consider what I hunt for. This is a super interesting, dynamic, and complex whiskey that starts in one place, ends in another, and has a tasty burn right in the middle. It starts in these nutty and dried fruits flavors. It travels through this baking spice area into a tasty, oaky, sweet vanilla burn that finally settles into this nice, oaky, woody aftertaste that is not the perfect whiskey for me, but Mm. this is the type of experience that I look for in wonderful, great whiskeys. Fair. Now, the price, this is interesting. Bardstown is an interesting company. They're doing interesting things. They're one of my favorite distilleries. Mm -hmm. I really love how they're kind of modernizing the whiskey industry. Very much so. They're really setting the bar on blended whiskeys. Their limited releases causing superficially inflated prices Mm -hmm. and scarcity is unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Because while the MSRP is exactly one hundred and twenty-five dollars, yo, <laughs> what? I did it. Uh, no, y'all I did it. Nailed it. Yeah, I was gonna say Matt did it first. I don't know. Matt say one twenty-five. I said one twenty-five. He said one twenty-five. Y'all both said one twenty-five, and that is remember. exactly the MSRP. Like, y'all nailed that. That is what they That's think crazy. this bourbon is worth. Yeah. For 125 this Absolutely. is a wonderful a whiskey. Great... Yeah. At 125 this a, is really, yeah. this is fighting at 125 mm-hmm. There are plenty of whiskeys right around the 125 mark that are, mm-hmm. like, right around this flavor profile. They're great. This is deserving of a 125 price. But? You're not going to find this whiskey. Um, unfortunately, this is probably a whiskey that our listeners will just not be able to experience anymore. If you did not already have the Bardstown Ferran, I don't know that you're going to get this whiskey anymore. I found it because a collector had an extra bottle, you know? And if you find it, you should probably get it because you're not finding this bottle anymore. This was released in 2022, I think, or late 2021. I can't remember the exact date, but they aren't going to release it again. And so you're, it's really just a toss up of whether you find this whiskey. Yeah, and that's can, unfortunate. $352 on caskers. Do they, can not. you actually buy it on caskers? It looks like it, yeah. It might also be for sale at Flaviar. Yeah, you can buy it for $352 at Caskers. Interesting. And then, actually, $344 at, from Flaviar. Yeah. I don't know. Here's the thing. That's well over double MSRP. That's almost triple MSRP. Yeah, that's almost triple. So, Nat, we just discovered you can Mm -hmm. actually get this from Flaviar for $344. So double. Almost triple. Almost triple. Triple. Double and a half. Yeah, it's like double and a half. But I don't know. Here's the thing. At $125, this bourbon is fantastic. At at $350? Look, it's not, it's not negotiable. It's not, go- you, it's not negotiable. When you move out of the the hundred dollar range, have we even right? gotten to that on this podcast? Have we even touched yeah. on things? Yeah, which one? We're we're talking about the cigar blend. The oh, cigar yeah. blends right up there. Yeah. Um, 
Did I saw we? That the, did I say that at the total wine? I did. Oh. The cigar blends, great. That was actually y'all's favorite whiskey, I think, so I far of the podcast. It was so good. Anyway, uh, go ahead, continue. So continue, continue. But I think the cigar blends the only one that we've had on the podcast that also approaches this price range, especially in MS, MSRP. Not just right. approaches, but fights at that level. You yeah, know? yeah, they're fighting at that level. Now, both here's the thing. The cigar blend, you're going to be paying above $200. For this, you're going to be paying above $200. I don't know that they're worth above $200. Both of them. And at that price range, you can start to look at some things from an MSRP perspective of things that are just phenomenal. phenomenal. Yeah. Right? You're starting to talk about you could get a midwinter dram for $200, right? Mm. Honestly, you should be getting it below that. But the DRAM MSRP is at about, I, I think it's like $120 or $130, right? The DRAM is better than both of these whiskeys. It, 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 that's one of the best rye releases of the year. The only rye that I feel that can compete with the DRAM right now for the 2024 releases is the Thomas H. Handy. In the Thomas H. Handy, you're paying $800. 500. 500 800 dollars like yep. so to say that this is you're going to be paying 300 dollars for this that's really unfortunate because i don't think you should pay 300 dollars for this no 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 i don't know seconded seconded mm. i don't see no, a way that you can go all. ahead and excuse 300 plus on this kind of on this bottle it's great let's not let's not confuse the fact that it's not a great tasting bourbon yeah. but the fact is that like the fact of the matter is there's a lot of great tasting bourbons out there there's some phenomenal uh bourbons out there there's some nigh like close to near perfect experienced bourbons out there for individuals yeah. and there's a price tag on them that equates to that value and if you're going to go ahead and say this general good bourbon versus the imperceptible pinnacle of your tasting experience with bourbon in this in the same echelon it's just it doesn't equate now i will say though like if you're not me and you just have 350 dollars burning a hole in your pocket well you're never going to be able to get it again so to you it might be worth it uh yeah but I do think you'll be able to find better things and similar things out there. Yeah. If you're patient and looking. Do you have anything so, else to say about this? Um, And it's a phenomenal whiskey. Uh, like, if you do get the opportunity to try this without buying it, please go try this whiskey. It, it has a flavor profile that is super cognac infused and just has some wonderful notes that I feel come from that cognac finishing that you don't see in a lot of other whiskeys. Definitely worth a try. Mm -hmm. Don't break the bank for it, but if you get the opportunity, do it. Yeah, it, it's it's well worth it. It is oh, a yeah. phenomenal phenomenal even with my review, wow. I, I I think it's a great bottle. The only uh, I know my dad will love this. Yeah. Like, the, the, it's for a, great a specific way. taste. It's for a specific taste, and if your taste lies in that spicy heat with a flavor profile and body around that, you can't yeah. really go wrong with it. It's the only issue is going to be whether you can find it at a way that, at at a price that's going to be sympathetic to your financial situation yeah. a great way to try to reproduce this at home is if you get one of those little two liter uh personal barrels once you're done aging alcohol in it because it has a limit basically to where it's not really going to give any more wood flavor and charcoal you know from the char into mm -hmm. your bourbons so basically now it's done it, it becomes kind of like a storage device you can just you can put stuff in it um put wine in that that wine will actually leave behind a yeah, lot of flavor yeah and then add something like old forester prohibition style 
and you might get something similar to the Ferrand, where you've got something strong, you infuse it with a little bit of sweetness, unless you gave it a really disgusting wine, <laughs> and then you're good to go. And Because I've done that, and I've had similar experiences where you're like, wow, there's so much more flavor in this bourbon now. It's a fun little thing to do. But yeah, yeah. Um, whenever you're yeah. already, I have some very so, fun games that I played recently. Well, well, well no, you forgot. Before forgot. that, you did. Oh, no. we have to talk about the Orphan Barrel. Oh, right. The, the literal question that I asked because I knew I was going to forget to ask the question. Yes. I never forget. Uh, uh, no, never no, 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 no. But so Stutzel and Weller kind of releases the Orphan Barrel for anybody who doesn't know. I, th I think we talked about it once before in the podcast. The Orphan Barrel is a, a thing that is done by the Stitzel Weller dis distillery where essentially they go, they find old distilleries, abandoned distilleries, ghost distilleries, and they go through and buy those up and taste whatever was left there, essentially. Mm -hmm. When they find a good barrel or grouping of barrels... They go through and they bottle it as what they call an orphan barrel. So you can usually find these these bottles at your local distillery sometimes for a long time. Like the Scarlet Rye, I found three of, they, they call it the, the Scarlet something. Cardinal or something like that. Yeah. The oh, Scarlet it's the Scarlet Shade. Shade the Scarlet Shade. Yeah. Scarlet Shade is a great 14-year rye. It, it's really good, but uh, it is pretty hot. We actually had it at the the distillery. I remember when we were there. But every day at the Stitzel Weller Distillery, they sell one bottle of this, and so and the there car. are two new ones that I haven't seen before. I don't know when the Indigo's Hour was released. But I think the two that you're kind of looking for are the Indigo's Hour and the Castle's Curse. Those are the two new ones, if I understand correctly. Those are cool. Every single bottle has a very unique art piece on it. They are super unique, obviously. And once they sell out, they're never going to happen again. Because remember, these are from distilleries that are not producing product anymore. They took these barrels, they bottled them, they're selling every bottle, and then it's done forever. <clears throat> so they're super unique. Now, I think the Castle's Curse is their newest one, which is a 14-year-old single malt, malt scotch that was distilled at the Tinanic Distillery in the Highlands of Scotland. It was matured in European oak casks, which gives it a complex profile usually with some citrusy notes and then you'll probably get some fruity notes up front but then you'll get a lot of that peat flavor most likely kelpie so tangerine Ooh. yeah they say tangerine but remember scotches under about 18 years will still have a good bit of peat to them. Peat, yeah. So you're you're gonna get these flavors that they're talking but about. You're also gonna get but you're gonna be higher soil. <laughs> and you know what? I think this picture actually does a great job. The castle's curse, right? You're in this underwater type of smoky feel. I really think that if you were under 18 years on a scotch, and this has just been my anecdotal experience. Any scotch that I've had under 18 years has some great flavors to it, but you have to think about them as being almost shrouded in a dusting of peat, right? So you see the picture, but there's mist covering it, right? Because you're going to get that peat. There's a matte finish over the entirety of the, of the actual flavor. Exactly. Yeah. Makes I'm sense. not saying that's bad. Some people love peat, and then you'll have to uh, try it. Mm -hmm. I do not mind peat, but I also I don't peat. want it to be the forward flavor. I love right? peat. 
I love them. And fake Pete is the worst. Man, if we go back to that uh, one place that Nat and I had a flight of... Um, Bro? Michters. Michters? If we go back to Michters this I'm weekend, mad about I'm that. not doing that again. Me and you were like... Nat and I were like, oh my god, Rye's the best. We love Rye. I think Rye's our thing. Yeah. yeah we're at Michters. Yeah, and like Eric and Mark are looking at like... <laughs> these other flights and that and i like they have a rye flight now worst if we ever rise ever <laughs> start getting access to some of these more interesting whiskeys i would love to try the michter's 10 year i've heard no. it's amazing I've heard it's amazing is it a rye, is it a rye? Or is it just bourbon no it's a kentucky straight bourbon okay see so, yeah, interested in that they Not have a 10 year rye. rye too actually but i've been burned once derek I won't be burned again. I know, I right? Never, burn never again. Never again, man. You ain't gonna take me so back to hell. Do they only sell? Do they only sell one orphan barrel a day? No, they sell one of each type. So, for example, per day? whatever. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. So, for example, if you wanted the castle's curse, they're gonna sell one a day. Interesting. You're gonna have to camp out like we did last time. Yep. Yeah, and hopefully uh, get breakfast. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. But again, a lot of people don't really like the orphan barrel ID idea. You you have to remember these are cool bottles. They're interesting, but they are almost certainly not worth the price that you're paying for their uniqueness. That's not to say they're bad and worth trying or worth getting even. But they oftentimes tend to be upcharged because they're one and done. They're one and done. So, for example, the Scarlet Shade, I think you have to pay something like $140 for the Scarlet Shade or something. That's a lot of money. I love the Scarlet Shade. It is a phenomenal ride. Right. Mm -hmm. But... But it's probably should be in the eighty dollar range, the uh, ninety dollar range. Mm, Eric, that's the problem. You know, actually, you know what? That's not a problem. It's not a problem because at that point in time, you're buying for Mystique as well. A hundred percent. There's a price tag for that. You can't yes. say that there isn't. I'm. I and I'm not saying that. Should the Scarlet Shade be priced lower? No, it no. probably should be priced where it is. It's unique. They put a lot of effort into finding these. They're, they put a lot of effort into the art, everything. Like, yeah, yeah. The, the presentation. And so, yeah. The presentation. So there is merit in that. And I don't want to downplay any of that. But could you also argue that you're going to get a better rye at $60, $70 that'll taste better? I think that's about the price range that it punches at. Mm hmm. And True. so you really should go into it with that expectation. That's the only thing I would say. I, Don't go into this expecting a rye that is flavor-wise worth a hundred and for the audience and anybody who's listening at home, Anthony decided that this was the head banging portion of the episode. <laughs> uh but it, Matt but yes. brought up the whole thing that I'm not the metal guy and I was you're wearing not. headphones earlier, so I had to do you're it. You're not. You're not. Anyway. No, but metal's too soft for me. Okay, go ahead. I would say, Eric, to, compl to kind of attempt to put a cap on what you're saying, you're buying a collector's item. 100%. Yes, yes yep. you can taste this collector's item and it does have a unique flavor palette as compared to other things that are not collector's items to other people this is very obviously a collector's item for somebody who is looking for that collector's item experience at this price level if you no. want collector's item as a bourbon enthusiast your price tag will go higher because that's the level of rareness that goes along with the bottles that are 500 plus dollars Yep. Now, I would say the Indigo's Hour would be the one that I'm more interested in trying. Is it the color or is no, it the flavor palette? It's the fact that you're getting an 18-year bourbon over a 14-year single malt. It's the single malt for you. Why don't you just say a single malt? 
Well, no, 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 a 14-year single malt. If we were talking like a 25-year no, no, single malt. I, I totally get it. Like you I said, the, you said the first half like it meant anything to you. You really meant that second part. Well, it's the aging. It, it's the uh-huh. aging of each individual. Okay. The 18-year bourbon sits right outside of what people consider the best age range for bourbons. Okay. Right? People think that the best age for bourbons is somewhere between 8 and in 16 years, right? When you start getting after 16 years, people actually think that the flavor kind of degrades a mm-hmm. little bit. It gets a little bit too much of that wood. Mm-hmm. And so you stop getting some of those interesting flavors. Mm-hmm. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, for scotches, what happens is as you age it more, you get less of the peat and more, more of the, of the interesting flavors. Yeah. So... For a 14-year bourbon, or, or sorry, for a 14-year single single malt scotch, I'm like, I, I want just a few more years on this. I want the peat to die down. And I have found that for me personally, once you get to about year 18, mm. every scotch that I've had that's aged 18 or more years, I have enjoyed thoroughly. Immensely. Yeah. Right? Every scotch that I've had under 18 years Crop has been problem. too peaty for me. That's not to say that there aren't, uh, you know, edge cases where that may not be true. The one I that just I'm thinking about? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh my God. no spoilers. <laughs> no spoilers. But the indigo sour seems super interesting to me because this is an 18-year bourbon. It's probably going to be super woody, right? We're going to get a lot of the oak on this bourbon. I am curious to see what flavor profile this bourbon has that somebody tried it and says, hey, I know they say 16 is the perfect year, but we should bottle this. Like, this is phenomenal. I... There are two options. Either... They bought this distillery for too much money or bought whatever this was for too much money. And they're like, we got to make this feel good. We got to make a good. little bit more money on this. Yeah. Right. Or somebody tried this and said, dude, guys, look, look at this. Try this shit, you know? And yeah. in that case, you're paying a little bit extra. But as far as I know, this, this Indigo's Hour is the expensive release of the year. Um... And the other one, the single malt, is actually the cheap release, which leads me to believe that this is about a five to six hundred dollar bottle, most likely at the distillery, and the other one is probably around two hundred dollars. Velvety finish, huh? Man. Okay. I'm dying to talk about video games. I'm, just just oh, so I'll know, I'll okay, be itching. Okay. I, I gave the, the I gave the description Steaming. of the Orphan Barrel. We have discussed. What have you been playing this week? All right, all right. Nat, do you have a short list? Do you want to go uh, first? Yeah, I can go first if you don't okay. mind. Okay. Yeah. Let's my, let's leave everybody in suspense for my, for another my, X my amount. Honestly, of pretty fast. Um, okay. Go for it. It's Hell Divers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No surprise there. Which is great. I I just recently came out of the the depression hole that was waiting to find out if a job was happening or not. So, I'm new to this whole like life thing. But anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, playing Helldivers. I booted it up, I think, like a few days ago, but after the update. And I don't know if you've fought any automatons recently above um, what difficulty was it? I guess it would be uh, Suicide Mission. Seven? Dude. It's seven. Yeah, I think it's above six. Um, they have AT-80s. Yeah. They, and Do then, they not and, always? And now... They have the, 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 the quadrupeds. I have not seen that. They have the four legs. But I have played a few rounds. And hmm. they'll tear your stuff up, dude. It's terrifying. Like, what do you like not, to bring against them? Quasar. Quasar that thing is so strong. Goated. It's so good. The Quasar con- It's just like it's, nonstop it's, EAT, it's, right? It's the second coming of the coming. Oh, my God. Rail cannon? It is the second coming of the rail cannon. Like I'm, That's I really nice. hope that they bring back the rail cannon. Well, sorry, the the rail gun because 
right now the quasar cannon does what the rail the railgun did, but with a timer. That's all. It, that's all that you're waiting for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So something we got to keep in mind whenever we're making a video game because that's happening someday mm-hmm. is uh, what Thor Pirate Software says, and that's Ooh, about this game. Yeah, he loves this game. Oh, but yeah. when you balance a game like this, you don't nerf the best weapon. Mm-mm. You buff all the other weapons. We've had this talk. And then after people get used to using other weapons because now they've been buffed, then you nerf the weapon that's still overpowered. I think you would still add more weapons before you nerf the ne- the, the most powerful weapon. That's a good idea if you have that like in the pipeline. Like, and ready I would to go. say like as soon as like because I mean a lot of their stuff is like cr- cranking out really fast. Like they just announced another war bond, and it's gonna be explosive themed. And I don't know if you've seen the the, uh, the teaser for it, but a lot of the weapons are looking super powerful. And I'm like, guys, I literally just bought the uh, cutting edge technology one. How are you guys not already even... coming out with like three new guns again? I'm not even in there yet. That's the third one, right? Jeez. This this is gonna be the fourth one. So, like, I'm so down, but at the same time, if that's the I'm, level of, of that's, if that's the level of content that you guys have on tap, because that doesn't that doesn't just come out of nowhere. Like, you don't announce that three weeks after the last one that you that you came well, out dude, with, right? I'm so curious about what's happening right now and the overarching storyline, because the story our mission, our like primary objective right now is to eradicate the automatons mm-hmm. like we are about to finish them yeah and if we succeed what happens what's next are they gone is there a third the, faction to come out guy, to save them last minute my guy what's going on man whatever they're happen? cooking i'm here for it i'm yeah, here so good. i'm here whatever it doesn't cooking, matter what it, it is. doesn't matter what <laughs> it is i'm here to give the fist of justice and democracy to all non-believers that's what yeah. i'm here for that and like uh, it's a great game um i've already said enough about that fantastic game um i don't know what where we're going in terms of the current uh major order and where that story is going to go i have a feeling they're going to take a certain uh enemy type off the board and add a new one that would be cool and that then cool. and then they're going to outbreak on a complete like probably on Cyberstan. And that's gonna be the melding place for Cyberstan you know, for, between you know, Cyberstan and the Illuminate. Sorry, what would also be perfect about this is so I haven't done much level nine um missions, but in watching uh Pirate Software do only level nine missions against the automatons, it's like the automatons are just too overtuned they can shoot you through trees without even seeing you and through Mm -hmm. objects and stuff like that so if we do defeat them and put them off the table for a while that might give the developers enough time to like fix enough issues to where level nine against the automatons is actually playable and enjoyable like it is with the bugs i I agree with that, but also level nine is supposed to be hell dive difficulty. It is supposed to be right, like but your the butthole is smaller than an atom. Okay. Yeah. You but are like, you are gaming. Th- <laughs> so that's a lot of people say that, but the thing is like, it's nowhere near. It is so much more difficult than against the bugs because oh, yeah. they're all ranged mm-hmm. and because they don't miss and so there's just like there's no it's there's just no slightly overtuned have, it's you slightly have noticed over-tuned. that right where like this there's no stray shots when it comes yeah. to automatons it there's never like peppering around your feet as you're running away it's always straight into your heart <laughs> straight into no into your thighs and your cheeks dude what are you talking about yeah because you're running away of course it's nuts it's so, like, ridiculous. one of the biggest things is, like, if one of the automaton's weapons is, like, going through another object, then their projectile passes through all objects. Yeah. So, it can't be blocked. Yeah. There's also, what is it? Um, they, 
I think they recently found a bug where like explosive rockets were actually going off multiple times whenever they hit a hell diver. So Jeez. that's why like oh, whenever a against rocket the hits you, you it was like a multiple exosuit. Like, I think it was, it was on like the exosuit. It was on the exosuit and the rockets from uh, the automatons. It was like a crit modifier. Like it would yeah. just like you, it would auto kill you. Like there was yeah. nothing that you could do. Like you could, it was like nuts. nothing could t- save you other than democracy protects. So, so one thing I can say to say tell tell people how good this game is. Nat and Eric know me as like a graphic snob. Like there will be some games where I'm like I don't want to play that because of what it looks like. Um, and I think I've got I'm the graphic snob, but okay, whatever. Oh, okay. Me and Nat are both graphic snobs. <laughs> okay, whatever. But I like, can play on ASCII art. To be fair, Eric. Yeah, Dwarf up. Fortress Continue over there. Anthony. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say that um, with there not being cross progression for Hell Divers two, the gameplay is so good that I've been playing while I was sick. You know, stuck on the couch. I've been playing on my Steam Deck uh, with like 720p, and. Mm. If you're staring at it, yes, you can tell. It doesn't look as good. But it still looks great. And when you're in the action, you don't notice anything. And I cannot believe that it plays so well on a handheld device. Like, it is can I impressive. Tell you something, something possibly as a hot take. Yeah. The, the, the time of handhelds is over. Why do you think that? I think That's a, that is a hot take. I think it's over. <laughs> I disagree. On I my, think, I think the people who are doing it right now, who are who are the only people who are possibly going to save it, are not the people that are getting the, the play for for handhelds right now. The Switch is king, and the Switch, another hot take, is hot garbage. Here's here's the thing, in. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, so the because uh, I read an article about this recently, and Amdia released their one of their uh, research papers. Who's Amdia? This, uh, they're like a research firm. They do sales numbers. They essentially release different reports on sales numbers for different gaming consoles and things like that. The fact that Valve released the Steam Deck in 2022. And since then, they have easily. Nat. They've easily? They easily passed 3 million units sold since it was released. As compared to the Switch. No, 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 no. I'm not saying in comparison to the Switch okay. because here's the okay. thing the Steam Deck is not aimed at people who care about handhelds. True. It's a game to gamers. You're right. This is simply a nuanced device to use in addition to your P- PC. You know or what? Or as your only be- PC is a college before, student. Before I continue this, let me go ahead and first say my experience with handhelds has been that this is great, but the screen is too small. It's just too small. I'm sorry. It just is. And there's, I don't think, unless you put an iPod, iPad size screen in my hands and put controller panels on either side, I don't know if you I'm ever going to get over that. You can I don't know do if I'm that. ever going to get over that. I'm I like, mean, here's here's the thing. The, Dude, Steam remote the play portable on the iPad. gaming market, uh-huh. apparently, yeah, according to the uh, market research that I'm looking at right now, hmm is close to 17 billion dollars a year that's a lot of money that's like a lot of money like I, I look you might be able to argue that in comparison to other markets it's not the strongest but i don't think you can say that it's getting worse yet or that it is even plateaued yet i think it's hard to argue that right Mm. So, the s the forecast of the the let's see maximize maximize market research dot com. I mean, their forecast for twenty twenty nine is that it's going to double essentially in by twenty twenty nine. 
So, like, we still got a while before mm. I think the portable gaming market starts to plateau and saturate as a market. That's fair. I Okay, then I, I reformulate my statement. I think that handheld gaming will forever be a less enjoyable experience until we make the jump into VR. Until you can go ahead and put on some goggles, put a controller in your hand and it's like your like your entire vision is your is your screen. I don't see handheld getting any further than where they're at. So, let me just for me. And also yeah. I, I my, the, my enjoyment is so limited by that aspect ratio. I don't know what it is about it, but that pinch screen doesn't do it for me anymore. I can't. Like well, I tried to play Hades one at some point in time on the Switch and I was like, "How can you do this? How is this possible? <laughs> I mean, in most situations, I think people are docking it. And I think so too. It's yeah. in the occasional traveling day or someone else is using the TV situation mm -hmm. and you want to play your game so much that you finally do it in the small form factor. I, but but when is, when is the last time that you actually sought out the handheld functionality of playing the game and it was just for the handheld functionality? Not because you had no other options to keep, continue playing your game. You wanted to play it as a handheld. I mean, are, like, are you excluding traveling? I'm excluding traveling. Well, you I mean, that, it just doesn't make sense to me because yeah. because you can say the same thing about playing video games. That's the, you can say the, the same whole... thing about playing video games. The same thing about sitting down to your computer and playing video games. You sit down to that computer to play games, right? But you can't always sit down at that computer. So right. when I was so sick, you're, so, so I the couldn't. functionality of the handheld is really what's bring you to the handheld it's not the fact that it gives the you the versatility the versatility of yeah. it is what brings yeah. you to it it's not the yeah. actual gameplay experience and that's what i'm saying that for me there is, there is the a gameplay, gameplay experience that i like about it the gameplay experience i like about it is being able to take it to my friend's place or take it to a lan and be in that situation in person while playing a game together without now, carrying I, an entire I think, tower i think i I think there is a okay. I think there's a kernel of truth in what you're saying, but I think you there is an inherent value mm -hmm. to convenience. Oh yeah. That it, uh, you're I don't think you're considering in this particular argument. Right? I, like I, like for example, yeah, ahead, for ahead, example, go ahead, go ahead. you're yeah. saying that Nobody is playing Hades on a mobile device if they're sitting at their computer. No. Right. Right. That, well, the well the think about it. Think about it. Okay. Okay. Like, go ahead. if I have my computer here and I have my handheld device and I want to play Hades, which one am I going to play on? Right. You're going to play on your PC. Probably going to play it on my PC. Yeah. That is kind of your core argument, right? Because that's saying. The the experience is always going to be better on my PC. Correct. But there is some inherent convenience to the handheld device mm -hmm. that may or may not drive you there first, even if you have both devices present. For example. Situational, yes. 100%. 100% yes. situational. Yes. But... As you increase the distance to your PC, uh -huh. that convenience and the the Becomes part a heavy of factor. Yeah. yes, yeah, and so there is some inherent value to this convenience that exists in this argument. When you say, Duh, "Is there a market for this?" Right? I think there so. so I think there is a market for it. I just, I don't enjoy um, the level of, I don't enjoy the level of, how do I word this? I don't enjoy the level of time, the level of 
investiture that you are allowed within this device as compared to being on a computer. <sighs> Damn. So my favorite thing about the Steam Deck and PC handheld uh, devices Debate. in general is that they all enable a PC gamer to consoleify and port port and make their gaming portable. So Helldivers 2 doesn't have cross progression. I can't play on my PS5 without starting over. But thanks to my Steam Deck, I can both play Helldivers on the road and play it on the console. And if my internet is good enough, which I found out it is, I can stream from my gaming PC via Steam Link instead of playing native. So I can play in very high resolution. I can play better than PS5 on my Steam Deck on my 4K TV. Yeah. And that is incredible to me. That That is so enabling. Mm. And I'm so happy that I have it for that. I think for me, I can understand the docking capability of capability of it and the transportation aspect of it. What really alienates me personally as a gamer when experiencing the handheld experience is the um, the the form factor and size that goes along with handheld is not inclusive for what I want from a video game whenever I play it. I do like to be able to actually take in the full breadth of whatever is being displayed. I don't know if I'd be able to punch in codes as fast as I I can now if my experience was looking at that small screen and finding out what that arrow actually looked like because it would take me a f- fraction fraction of a second more to know what direction it's supposed to be in and then god forbid you're trying to go ahead and access a terminal with lights directly over it and you can't see diddly squat and there's no real way to go ahead and combat that without time and balance for an experience so i don't know so something that might help is that our perspective is very different than uh, new gamer perspectives. There have been game jams where they set up all of these uh, you know, desks or whatever with a controller in front of them. Mm-hmm. And all of the kids that are younger, uh, teenagers, new adults come in. They sit down ready to play this game. It's a new game. It's like a demo. Maybe it's at like a PAX. Mm-hmm. They take the controller, they move it to the side, and they touch the screen. I the hate screen. that. Oh god, I hate right? that. Right? But think about this. They have only experienced games on their phone. Yeah. And now something like the Steam Deck or equivalent looks like a phone. It has a touch screen, but it also can introduce these brand new gamers that don't know what they're missing <laughs> to the world of a controller. And also, at the same time, it can introduce them to the world of a keyboard and a mouse because they can plug those into it as well and plug it into a bigger screen. And there, apparently, there are so many LAN parties nowadays where that's what they bring. They because bring a Steam Deck. Yeah when, yeah. when I was a teenager, I bought a PC from my friend who built PCs in bulk for 500 bucks, And I had to pay an extra $140, $160 to get a graphics card in it. So I paid $640, maybe nearly $700 of my hard-earned summer money to this guy. And it was amazing because for the first time in my life, I had a better PC than Eric. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved it for one month. Until he <laughs> and then Eric smoked your ass. And then he got an upgrade. Uh, I'm just kidding. I can't remember if that's exactly what happened. But yeah. I would, if I was re- to rewind and I had that same summer money, hands down, easily buying a Steam Deck or something similar instead of a desktop from my friend who can't give me a warranty with no peripherals, no screen. <laughs> like that didn't include a screen, just you know? The tower. Like just the tower. I I think I was lucky enough to use a screen that my parents had that was like an old square screen that I had for a very long time that there's pictures of me in my dorm room with. Bruh. So. Did you raid one that? 
uh, I rated on an Inspiron laptop that <laughs> uh, barely able to go into storm winds. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I learned how to optimize the hell out of I that laptop. You, oh, that's right. You were using your trackpad or something like that, weren't you? Were you no, the person I that had you a mouse. With it, it was playing with trackpad. I might have uh, used the trackpad a little bit, but I had a mouse. I could not do yeah, trackpad. We had friends, Michael and Matthew, that did trackpad, and we both were like, Dude, how, how, how? How? how are you playing Battlefield 2 with a trackpad? That just what? doesn't make any sense. How are you playing World of Warcraft with a trackpad? What? Crazy. Anyway, so I, I, ex- I understand your, uh, your position, and I do feel as if my mindset has been changed in, in that regard. I... I Don't think you just I, know what's good, man. You know I, what's good. I, I I can't help the fact that one, I know what's good, and then two, like it's so easy to say yes, the Steam Deck is the future. But the fact of the matter is Nintendo. I don't think it's the future. I think it's a gateway. It's a gateway drug it's to proper the, PC and console the, gaming. The gateway is in the future, Anthony. It's the future. Shut up. Anyway, I was saying I just feel as if in ter- in the realm of handhelds and all of these and, and all these advancements the the ROG Ally apparently is fantastic as well. So it's a it's a competitor to the Steam Deck. With even with those two things doing amazing in their individual lanes for the handhelds, the main dominator is the Switch. And it is a piss poor experience. And it is the only experience I've had as an adult with gaming and a handheld. So yes, that's, it's, it is a it is it's wonderful to know that there is a, another experience that ta- that elevates that and makes it different. But for me, the only thing that holds Nintendo afloat is its IPs and nothing else. There's nothing about that company that is so, forward, that's forward thinking in terms of like making sure that their games actually cut the edge of what they're supposed to be doing. I don't think I've, that's Nintendo's goal. Though. No, it's not. And like, I know that. I know that. It's just like I, I, I weep for the kid who's like, man, I really wish that this game would load faster or I really wish that this game didn't have to be this small on my screen or I wish my joy cons wouldn't start drifting on me three months after I bought them. And I don't think they, that uh, I do. I don't think that any kid that is growing up in today's age that I know of at least Mm. is going and playing these games. And that is what they were thinking because I, of course, because you have to remember they don't have the previous experience, but they're. But the thing is, so, they're not having that experience because they're not going to play it. No, no. As soon no, no, as that, as soon as I something dis- happens that doesn't that doesn't meet. I what disagree. They want. I disagree because I I have seen my friends' kids sit here mm-hmm. on my PS5 and hit wall after wall, and he'll sit there for four hours PS5, until that on a until PS5. that shit is working. Do that shit on a switch. He on has a, hand, a switch on a handheld. He did no, that in handheld. Do that shit on the switch. He did. That's what he I'm hit saying. Wall after wall on a yes. switch. Yes, with Minecraft. That's all he wants. It's like My, I'm telling dude, you, no, Minecraft's a drug. You. Stop. That's not a real representation of what happens on a Switch game. Give him Breath of the Wild. Minecraft is so much worse than any other experience on Switch. I'm not. No, I'm saying that in terms of being able to get you involved in a game, regardless of how it works, that game can be modded. It can be unmodded. It can run on garbage and people will love it. It is. But what I'm. It's the the only thing that really competes against Roblox in terms of keeping child retention. But what I'm getting at is that any other game that you download on the Nintendo Switch is designed for the Switch. Yeah. Nintendo proctors everything that goes that. on to their I platform. I hate that. But you know what that means? I have never had a buggy bad experience on a Switch game. Nintendo makes sure that everything that gets onto that platform works really, really well for that platform. I've I had a few I crashes look- with Cult of the Lamb, but okay. 
Uh, I haven't played Call of the Lamb. That's fair. Yeah. I don't know that experience, to be fair. But when's the last time you played on your Switch? Uh, are you talking to me or not? Me? For me, I'm to Eric it was because... like a month ago. Oh wow! Okay, I haven't played on my Switch since I got my Steam Deck because it's yeah. that much yeah, better. It's that much I... better. Yeah, you would never go Look, back, right? I'm not no. saying there aren't yeah. better experiences. Like the Switch is not some uh, holy grail of mobile platforming that you should look to to dictate w- what the market does, right? Like mm. the the Steam Deck is better, I and there are even better okay, options yeah. that are going to come out in the future. Yeah. Like, right, but what I am saying is that to use the switch as some arguing point for saying that mobile platforming or mobile platforms have these huge negatives to them, I also think is not entirely accurate because if you go into the switch even today, I can guarantee you i I can go grab my switch and play all of the games on there and have no issues doing it. True. Because Nintendo just caters that experience. That is their whole goal. That is why very few people sit here and complain about the Switch experience. People aren't buying the Switch because it's the best on the market. They never did. They never cared about that. What are they buying the Switch for? Nintendo-only games. Because that's, that's the only reason it exists is because it's the only place you can play Mario. Or Zelda. On right? a nine-year-old Android processor. <laughs> Look, but nobody cares about that. They just want to play yeah. Zelda and Mario. Yeah. It's all about the experience. We do. And that is why I love my Steam Deck so much. Because I get to experience an insane number of things that I wouldn't get to experience outside of it. Like right now, I have access to a game that isn't on Steam. But I've been able to play games like World of Warcraft and Diablo 4 on my Steam Deck just by setting up a few little things and learning yeah. a little bit about the Linux command line, which I mean, I already knew, but like if I didn't yeah. know, I would have learned about it. And that's kind of cool. And introduces Nerd. people to computer science and Nerd. whatnot. And oh. so like, I, I've played a lot of Pal World on my Steam Deck. I'd recently started playing Pal World on the Xbox because I was sick and uh, still a great game. Yeah. Um, it's and still then really now I'm very curious if I can get this game called Bitcraft to play on my Steam Deck remotely. This is a game that is in closed alpha, and I got really lucky because I happened to copy and paste a key faster than anybody else out of like 16,000 people waiting for the key. Wow. And Bit I cave? played. What's it called? Here, I'll show it to you guys. Okay. It's, this art style is right up my alley. This game is so cool. And um, so oh, it looks cool. I like I'll put that. it on here so that we have it for the whatever. Ooh, the recording. So Bitcraft is kind of like a merger between old school RuneScape, Minecraft, and Valheim. Yeah, I knew it was going to have Valheim. You I'm going to click play on this God. video, and that doesn't do anything. So we're just going to keep on scrolling. Now, what kind of game is it? What is the gameplay like? This is game, it just a... Uh... Apparently, it's similar to EVE. So there's a ton of different skills. Um, and you can craft, you know, the right items for every well, it's skill. It's an MMORPG. It's an MMORPG. There's a huge world. I believe it's going to be one world. It just it's it's kind of like Star Citizen in that aspiration. They've been working on this for over five years. It's insanely well developed for a closed alpha, um, but it's going to be very dependent on player economics and stuff. So you can solo this game, but you are very much rewarded for working with other communities and cities and towns and being like the blacksmith. For this group of people, what is and, the, what is the combat like? Is there combat? Is there is it an exploration game? So there, there is hunting, but they're being very careful with PvP, right? They don't. So I listened to a lot of the like lead game designer and CEO talk about this yesterday, and basically, with the way that the game's set up, because you can create your own 
uh, basically establishment, right? And if you don't have enough supplies, that establishment suddenly becomes free reign. Someone else could claim your territory if you haven't logged on or your community it. hasn't maintained it, right? Um, so there's an interesting balance there. Like my little tiny establishment takes like 14 resources an hour, but an establishment I joined is using 300 something resources an hour. And I couldn't do that by myself. Definitely not. Um, so they don't want a sort of PVP situation where you come and just take it over, right? That requires some very complex systems in play. So what they're really looking into is PVP on the kind of piracy scale, because you only get to teleport to one bedroom. So if you You're have multiple towns, hmm? You're a robber baron. I don't know what that is. You literally run the world based on what kind of resources you can provide for your society and whoever yeah. whoever leverages the most resource, whether it be societal or actual material, rules the world or rules yeah. the area. Yeah, so like where where you start off, um, at least where I started off, there's a big city and there's just tons of little towns, so I'm calling it a city. And I mean, they're decently large. But there's no lavender. And in the tutorial, it's like, go harvest some lavender so you can get this, so you can make things. There's none anywhere for a long period of time. I explored 0.5% of the map, which took like an hour or two to explore half a percent of the map. Couldn't find a single thing of lavender. And it wasn't until I crafted something to get a cart. And I was like, how do I how do I find this guy that will give me the cart for giving him this thing? And someone's like, Oh, just go South. Here's the coordinates. You'll find uh Brico was his name. And he has it. He didn't have any in stock. I keep going. Another Brico didn't have any stock. Another I eventually Brico. There's two Bricos. They're like traveling merchants that hang uh, out at dungeons. They've all been cleaned out. I ended up exploring like 1.5 or to 2% of the map which took another like two to four hours, not finding any. But what I did find was copious amounts of lavender very far away. So I can, so at some point they're going to need that city that I was talking about. They're going to need people to import lavender to them. And I believe that's where they want to impart PVP. When you are transporting goods from one location to the other and you're in a risky situation um, because I think you already have enough upkeep with your town that they don't want people just like come and bombarding and destroying your town and stuff like that and they're trying to keep it lighthearted so when you die you're just like knocked out it's a very lighthearted game but it is really cool it really imbibes that like you actually need to trade and work together and talk uh, every person I came across was like, hey there, what you up to? How you doing? Welcome to my town, you know, like, and people could post jobs for their towns. Like I became a, a farmer or something like that for one. And it's, it's really, really neat. Um, they're, they're, they have a bunch of blog posts about how to do things like preventing or trying to avoid real money trading. Cause that's not something you can actually prevent. True. Um, yeah. but it's something you can discourage due to psychology uh, there's one interesting thing where so you can terraform you can make a level go up and down right mm -hmm. but in order to avoid I can't remember what they call it the further away from the, the starting level the harder it gets but if it's already really far away from the starting level it's easier far easier to bring it back down to where it began so you can go and undo someone's ridiculous like wall of dirt dirt relatively quickly um yeah so it, it's been really cool like it, it really feels like you could be a traveling merchant or a fisher or a blacksmith in this game and that's all you do and you could like basically make yourself an npc or you can do it all and and solo and because like while i was on that very long trek i was like i kind of want to just make my camp here away from everybody else and like have set up a tent 
and tell them, yeah, trade me some stuff for it. Bring, bring me some stuff, you guys. So, so far, so good. It's really cool. I want to play more, but there's a queue, so I can't play. <laughs> right now. Mm-hmm. Dang. Dang it. Oof. So I read Wait. the summary at the end. Yeah. And it it harkens to it feels like a very soft um oh my god see if these if see if these had actual progression <laughs> if see if see if these had actual progression this is like what it would do and was actually an MMORPG like they're trying to i think I, I'm, I didn't hear them say this specifically, but it sounds like I don't, maybe there's multiple servers, but the server's huge, huge, hundreds of the, players. I saw the announcement trailer and I get the scope of it and the breadth of it. The immediate thing that that triggers for my brain, but that I don't see and kind of disenfranchises my interest from it is that there's no... There's no delving into that in terms of like, how do I say this without sounding like an immediate Chad? No, no, never mind. How do I get stronger? <laughs> so you do have like every thing is a skill, right? So there's skills to level up for I hunting be or shiny. mining or whatever. But at the same time, there is that. So while I was wandering about, I ran into one of the traveling merchants that I, wasn't the one I was looking for. Uh-huh. But I suddenly saw, oh, he can take a power core, a damaged power core, and like this rusty nail from ancient technology or something like that. And he'll give me a better one. And the annoying thing was I just dropped that nail so that I could harvest more lavender since I'd never found lavender. And there's a two minute timer on how long dropped items will sit there. So I booked it back to grab that. I had like four seconds left, picked it up, went over there, and I got a better uh, power core for my hands, I guess, right? Because you're all automatons. And that was just Uh, my power core. There is armor. There is dungeons. There there are these things things right so there um, is combat because yes. the way that they're portraying it it's not that combat is the forward facing theme and or activity it, of it this definitely game. looks more like a runescape yes. where each of these skills mm-hmm. has its own progression ladder mm-hmm. and so combat will be one of them and it'll have its own progression but if you have 20 skills, that'll be 1 20th of the game. Mm. And, right. maybe yeah. it's because and you don't I even have to explore all of it. And maybe it's yeah. because I've never oh, played really? RuneScape and it didn't really like, it didn't really talk to me whenever I did. But uh, it's really pretty. It it's, does. I, the art style is right up my eye. I it, love it low gives me poly. Journey, it gives me journey vibes. And like, it, you, you know what it is? It reminds me of the, um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the name of it. The one with the fox that is just absolutely gorgeous. Yes. Um, now I can't remember that either, but I did see I, it. I, I While know, you're thinking I'm about that, I'll fox. point out that they're using hexagons for their things, as you can see here. Mm-hmm. So it's not yeah. blocks. And so it gives it a nice little style, which is really really cool oh yeah tunic. It, it tunic lo- is the tunic game tunic yes tunic. thank you it it looks like a less cutesy tunic yeah mm. uh, it's it's very enjoyable i'm very impressed in closed alpha i mean it's i know it's not nearly as complex but it's definitely better than star citizen which is in like an alpha <laughs> Oh yeah, dude. You I mean, they have a freaking light mode and a dark mode for your menus already. Like, I feel like at some point this podcast will be like dealing with Anthony's Star Citizen withdrawal more he's than gonna, he's gonna have like to stop. It's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna have to put it. He's like, down, it'll, man. it'll come out one day. It'll, it'll be. Here. Did you hear the new update? It'll be here in two weeks. They added a new feature that's going to be stripped down and not added to the real game in about a year. But by that time, the game will be out, so that's fine. As as much as I lo- as we love to give him shit, though, I, like I would love Star Citizen to be complete at some point because it, it the idea is like ten out of ten perfect. 
Uh, execution is everything. Well, not even the execution, just where it is right now versus how long it'll take him to get to there I is I said. So, unknown. I said so I this said. is a perfect segue, though. So to wrap it up with uh, Bitcraft, you know, the lord of this game is very it's very grindy okay sorry that's not an allure necessarily for some it is it will be grindy and they are proud of that but you can get like that proper feeling of progression like in world of warcraft classic where you are moving forward but not but you get what you couldn't get in world of warcraft which is like i'm a cook and that's it i just want to be a cook and people actually need you and you can be the best cook around and do things that are unique and on top of that, it's got, you know, the valheim uh destructible everything, but not the combat, so far as I've seen. With my first bow, level one, I have, like, three abilities that don't really notice. It just feels like RuneScape, right? Um, but then the biggest thing really is the dependency on one another in the community and people actually working together. I don't go by people and not talk to them. We all talk. Like, everyone's talking. Even global chat is great. Uh, but it is closed alpha. But the, the segue is, big. Go ahead. is to this other game called Enshrouded. Uh, this is a game that I, I oh, yeah, heard yeah. of this. We know Enshrouded. Actually, we touched on it a little bit a few weeks ago. Did we? On, yeah. So I think this might be a single-player game, unfortunately, or maybe a co-op. So it's not nearly as MMORPG as Bitcraft. But from what I saw, there is an incredible amount of granularity in the crafting system, unlike or not crafting, building system, unlike Valheim, which is good, but wa wanting, uh, but it's definitely better than certain other games. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, this game, I think, if I remember right, when it was first presented to some players, they were like, the combat is boring, the combat is terrible. And then the devs were like, you're right. And they redid it completely. And now it's like really engaging and fun and challenging and skill-based combat. So this, yeah, is and this, is, that we, this is the one that we played before together. Combat trailer. And, yeah, and this is... this. It, 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 so this plays similarly to Valheim. Oh, this is uh, not the game that we played before. I thought no, you no, were talking no, 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 no. uh, Are you talking in Dark we, and Darker? This, yeah. We, but we talked about this when... In the episode where Power World first released. And this is the one that's kind of... This and Power World are reshaping this idea. I, I don't know a good way to call them. I almost a want survival to call game? them... Oh yeah, that's another aspect. Well, I want to call them Breath of Wild Lights. Oh. Right? Or Likes. Mm. Because they, you're 100% right. They are a Valheim survival Rust type of game, but they add in so many Breath of the Wild mechanics mm -hmm. on top of that that it really turns into like it's a it's a total middle of the line mix between those two ideas. Right? I agree. And this and Pow World are both released at the same time. And both really redefine the genre and say, hey, hey, you like Rust and you like Breath of the Wild. Here's the in-between. Now, Pow World went on to the route of, hey, you have pals or Pokemon or whatever you want to call them. And Shrouded said, hey, you like mystical elements like Valheim. Here they are. Mm. Have and you played in Shrouded? I see. I didn't realize you could play this one. Yeah. Uh, I've played a little bit. I haven't gotten into it. It really is a co-op experience. I think this is another one where going into it co-op will feel so much better because it just it doesn't have a lot of depth from a single player perspective. The interaction with other players now, really adds the depth. We for didn't me, really say it, it is so it is in pre early access it is it is so it is not released so it's not I, I don't think it's quite fair to an early access game to present such um criticism well so i don't think the game's trying to be this single player experience to be fair so 100 oh. percent agreed maybe they'll add stuff and uh, the, it, it, 
mine. But I also, at least personally, early access are released games to me. <laughs> I don't think... I, I think that once you're paying for a game to well, say that it's not released actually, doesn't have a lot of merit to me. The thing I disagree with there is that in Shrouded, has, the devs have shown, if I'm not wrong about this, that they actually will listen to the player base and completely overhaul an insane amount of work to make them happy. And if they're willing to do that, then when it comes in early access, no, it, it's not released it's hey do y'all like this what don't y'all like oh you don't like that okay we change it and they did i see that happen with good games that are released as well so like my 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 thing is and this is just for me i a hundred percent understand and agree with your viewpoint of early access i'm not saying it's wrong by any means this is an entirely a personal thing for my own fiscal mentality and my gaming mentality and just how I prioritize games in my own time is that if there is a game and I am spending money on it, I am spending money on it in regards to what it is at this very point in time. Mm -hmm. And when you give me the option to do that as a game developer, I am going to base my experience right now off of that if you change that to such a degree that it is totally different, I am one of those people that I am willing to shift my mentality and say, you turned everything around and did something different. Now you're a 10 out of 10 and I'm back on board and I'm totally willing to take. I understand that a lot of people aren't like that, but just to kind of preface this with that. If, for example, Entrouded, I'm not going to use Entrouded because I don't think that's fair to Entrouded. Entrouded is actually really really good as it is i just don't think they're focusing on a single player aspect i think really that co-op experience is where these types of games shine in general and i think entrouded is pushing that as well but if you were to have a game let's call it um uh rusted or something like rusted whatever and it is a game <laughs> that releases an early access and it's absolute dog crap. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to pay $20 for this. At the moment, I pay $20 for it. I play it and I'm like, holy so, crap, this is terrible. That's something I, I wanted am to, going to, to add to what you were saying, because I agree with what you're saying for Enshrouded, because they want you to pay $30 to play early access. That's a lot of money for early access. Huh? In my mind, early access is like, 10 or 15 dollars because it's basically like uh play testing in a sense and not guaranteed to be like a, a, a full game so like you know are they going to price it up when it fully releases or are they just going to keep charging 30 dollars uh, so i don't know it's kind of weird to me i am I, I am very much a person that i judge games by the merit that they are when I play them. And that doesn't mean that early access games, uh, 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 like I don't consider early access games different than release games. I've had released games that are absolute dog crap and I play them and they're terrible and I hate them. And they cost 70 bucks. I've had early access games that are $70 in complete messes but so remarkably novel and fun and interesting that I did not regret spending $70 on them. But if you're in early access and you're the same level of not fun crap that that released game was, guess what? I'm, I'm saying your, your game is crap until you prove to me that you are going to change it and make it enjoyable, right? I judge you based on what you are showing. I am not expecting perfection or a re production quality from released games or non-released early access games because there is no such thing in the gaming world. Every single game that I know of is being patched, fixed, and changed as it goes on, whether or not it's in early access or released or not. If you're a fun game, you're fun from the moment that gameplay is accessible. 
Now, well, I I disagree with that because in what, how do you define um, the first play test? How do you get those players in to tell you whether or not something is fun or not? Because ap- apparently for Entrouded, people played it and they're like, this isn't fun. And they're like, oh, you're right. So they fixed it. Um, but that's but here's the here's the defining difference how, for me. You can't if, know something's not fun necessarily until others have told you. But here's the thing. If I play early access and Entrouded and I was one of those people that I was like, hey, your combat's not fun. This isn't very fun. And then I, I rated the game a one out of ten. And then you went and changed it. And now combat's fun and the game is super fun because of it. And I'm like, this is a 10 out of 10 game now. I am willing to make that 180. Those are two different experiences that I have now had. Just because they're the same game, it doesn't mean I'm going to judge the first one less harshly. I'm not going to go into the first one with the mindset of, I'm expecting you to change this. This is the only difference for me. I'm going to go into the one and say, if you never change this, this is what it is. If you do change it, it is no longer what it is. But so many games go into early access, release what they have. They're not fun and they never change it. And it's never fun. Some games go into it and they change it immensely and it's become super fun and it's awesome. Some games are immensely fun, change it, and then it's absolute crap. And they're not fun. All I'm getting at is that when you play the game, your opinions, whoever that this may be, not just y'all or me or anybody, when you play a game, your opinion is valid. If you think it's fun, it's fun. If you think it's not fun, it's not fun. fun. And you should never have an expectation that it is going to change for better or for worse. Right. And hopefully I didn't say that because what I was, what I think I said is that. yeah, yeah. These guys had a early access or play test or whatever. I don't know. People said this isn't fun combat wise. And they are like, okay, you're right. Let's spend thousands of man hours to fix that. Hey. It's a huge undertaking. And they did it. And like you just said, most studios don't end up doing that. Yeah. And um, I'm going to go ahead and bring up Ashes of Creation because this is the other game that I could be getting confused with what I'm saying about because that's oh, yeah. the other game I've been thinking about. So if I'm wrong about Pillars Pillars of Creation, oh my god, what game were we just Ashes talking about? And Shrouded, and Shrouded. Then apply all that to Ashes of Creation because that's the other game that we've been waiting like weeks to talk about but keep on forgetting yep. to. Yep. Um, so Ashes of Creation, the most interesting thing that's similar between this and Bitcraft is it's another MMORPG that specifically has like raid mechanics around traveling caravans, bringing your like guild's caravan from one city to another. Cause kind of like what, what was that game that we all try to play from Amazon studios? Um, uh, Oh, uh, lost. Um, Oh yeah. You're so close. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but there's a game where they had a bunch of different towns and at first, yes, your loot was stuck at that town and if you wanted to bring it over, you had to leg it. Um and this game is like doing that New World. N- New World, yes. Ugh. So this game's doing something similar, I think, j- but they're not like uh going to go back on it and be like actually never mind because they're making it a core game mechanic where you can raid someone's caravan if you beat them, they'll drop all their stuff. But guess what? Now you need to bring your own caravan to pick all that up. And if they're quick enough, they might organize and try to take their stuff back. Um, and I am so interested. So, uh, two two things. One, I unfortunately did look this up after we talked about it last time. I cannot talk about my experience that I have played with Ashes of Creation other than to say I have played it in an earlier version are you sure because since then people have played it on stream my experience was different i see so so uh, yeah yeah it would be uh, it would not be representative it is a different game than how it is now the one that i have played Hmm. other than to say i have played it in super super early accesses i can't 
Same. Yeah. So here's an interesting thing. So like in Bitcraft, as y'all, I don't know if y'all saw, but you build up cities as the pl the players build the cities on the landscape. They don't just exist. I don't know if that's true for Ashes of Creation, but as it says here, cities will literally rise and fall. You, the player base shapes the world of Vera. Like mm -hmm. it's a fully, supposedly fully dynamic world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am I am so interested because of the way that New World went and because of I have been I have played so many MMOs and so many MMOs like this or that have tried to do something like this. I have and not. I've never every, seen an MMO try to do this. And that's why I'm well, so curious because I've never is, heard of anybody trying to do something like this nor like Bitcraft. It's because they change it once it hits the market because it doesn't is so far it has not performed well and every single game that has done this from things like um oh my gosh what is what is the name of the 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 most popular one eve that is online? released no not not eve eve's not a terrible example of this Eve's probably actually the closest to this that is still keeping true to kind of how it is yeah that's what's similar between ash of creation bitcraft and eve have similarities yeah so the the best the best example is the kickstarter game that i am just forgetting the name of it's a top down it plays similar to league of legends but it's a fully open world player driven economy sandbox MMO and new world was also designed with this intent as well. And every single one backtracks for different reasons. And I'm not saying they're valid reasons. I'm just saying they think they're valid reasons and they backtrack and move to something else that is more PVE group oriented because of reasons some of them think it sells better some of them think it markets better i don't i have been seeing quotes of many different reasons more they're more approachable but what it what it ends no, up no, no. Being, i think it might be it could possibly be a real money trading uh combat so there's a lot of games that do really well they have a great implementation and then they go and look at their expenses the, the devs look at their expenses and they're like we're spending so much money on real money trading like support tickets for people that are getting scammed and stuff like that so Maybe, we just yeah. need to get rid of it and I'll one of on. the strategies for on. getting rid of it i'll be on online okay one of the strategies for getting rid of real money trading is to heavily restrict player trading but the thing is that is a very compelling game design uh like okay. situation like people want to trade that's that is bitcraft trading is bitcraft they if they restrict trading you, your game's dead like you don't want to do it anymore that happened in runescape trading yeah. was fun and interesting and they got they heavily restricted it slash removed it so now the game's not fun anymore cuz it's like well the social dependency interaction stuff is gone and so i think one of the things that people talked about was that real money trading is something you have to consider in your game design you have to heavily consider player psychology how they're going to do things how to encourage them in certain ways and understand that you're never going to get rid of real money trading but there are ways to reduce its likeliness yeah. and it's like i don't know risk reward factor yeah it's Thanks it's really me. unfortunate to me that the the most profitable and long-standing mmorpg of this style is black desert online <laughs> i don't see black desert online like these at all How so is this is they're they're sandbox mmos they're player driven economy 
They focus around moving player supplies. driven economy or moving supplies. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all of the, all of these games don't have a typical economy based off of like normal raids or things like that. Instead, their focus is upon player driven economies. That's what a sandbox MMO is. They essentially give you tools, and then you go into that world use those tools to create an economy or an experience. This is what EVE Online does. This is what Ashes of Creation is trying to do. This is what Albion Online, Black Desert Online, all hearkening back to the original Ultima Online, right? Which is probably the, 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 the one that defined this genre. Um, there, there are earlier ones, but I think Ultima Online is probably the one that really started this idea. And Black Desert Online definitely is not that anymore. Black Desert Online is definitely one of the ones that I'm talking about that changed all of this. I to say, I, yeah, I was looking at it to and a there different was nothing experience. about that. And I never experienced it when I played the game. When it initially came out, this was its goal. It was pretty commerce based, yeah. But it is not anymore. And it wasn't it hasn't been for a very long time. I am not saying that I like I am looking forward to this type of experience and I want some type of experience like this to take off and be good. You said that just, just in time because I was about to be like, man, your pessimism is killing me. <laughs> no, I want this to succeed. I love this idea. Ultima Online was phenomenal. Ultima Online started like this and has stayed like this and still has an active player base to this day for almost 30 years. Right, it's one of the most long-standing MMOs up there with like EverQuest and EverQuest Two that still has an active player base. It is the original, and it does this, right? And it has never changed from that ideology. Every other one has. I want a new one to do this type of thing, but all of them are playing chicken with this idea of what sells the best in the market and every single one of them loses that chicken game at the last moment and changes to something else which is why i i i, I want this to just keep on track and do that i am just skeptical because every other company has said they were said the exact same things and then they just veer off at the last moment usually oh. right after release so the thing is, like, I think you can argue that World of Warcraft is a player-driven economy, right? And well, no, 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 no. So these are different because right, you, 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 like, this isn't the same as like World of Warcraft. Black Desert Online isn't the same as like World of Warcraft because there is no economy from the game itself. World of Warcraft has an economy that is purely driven by raiding and pve and all of these things that you have right and that kind of sets the bar for what the economy is but albion online black desert online all of these things they go by this idea of the people have to move these resources and that causes what the value is for them so that's what makes me so curious about these games because Nat brought it up earlier the Sea of Thieves style of oh you got some good stuff and you're taking it from point A to point B yeah I'm going to come over and I'm going to take that and I'm not going to do any work except for killing your butt and thanks for doing all the work for me that is what makes Bitcraft and Ashes of Creation intrigue me because if that I've never played an MMO that does that. So that's why I'm like, what do you mean Black Desert did that? I played Black Desert. I didn't see that. I'm looking for the piracy, basically, the highwaymen, the the taking over of their their hard earned crap. And give it give it to me. I want it. Yeah. That's reasonable. So I, I, I don't know. Like I I know you've played more games, but you're saying Black Desert had that, and I, I never saw it. Oh, uh, I, 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 no, a hundred, a hundred percent. This was Black Desert's idea. 
any anything that had this sandbox idea around its initial design because that's really that's defining the sandbox mmorpg experience interesting i could see that maybe these games end up making things a little too complicated and unnecessary that's like yes yes they do they do it's the reason why black desert eventually just became like a uh a dress-up simulator hey uh, that pays the bills it does pay the bills it does pay the bills they make bank Bank money off of psychology Mm -hmm. unfortunately Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. did you was that it? Uh, Eric, was it? Is it you? Is it me? I think it's you. Right? Why? Why not be? Why not be nice and sweet? I, I only have two things. Oh. Uh, so my week has mostly been Rift Wizard too. <laughs> I have gotten two successful wins. One of them. <laughs> Rift Wizard Two is also amazing. Not by the way, for, for I'm anybody just disappointed. interested, <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> so, one of them was. Uh, a, a wonderful chaos build essentially when i dealt one damage type it would deal 500 other t- damage types and it was super fun and then my second win i did an arcane build where i just did all arcane damage this game is all about just making cool interesting interactions interactions this looks like it's a more boring version of that one game where all the pixels are. Sorry, I'm just teasing because I just saw like You're a spreadsheet of to text. Say boring, come yeah. on. It's in my name, man. I'm bored of it. I, I everything bores me. Like that's just that's just part of it. Like that's the character. But what's that game that you love that is interesting? The uh, Noida, not Noida. Is it Noida? Noita. Noita. Where yeah. like you're a wizard, you grab wands and you try to experiment and then suddenly you blow yourself yeah. up and you're like, whatever. Oh, 100%. This is, uh, if I were to rate them, like Noita is just one of the coolest games of all time. I, I think I said at some point in the podcast, that's like my tied for my second favorite game of all time. It kind of goes back and forth with um, Final Fantasy VII and uh, Shapes and Beats. Honestly, Shapes and Beats is great. Dude, very good. Like, they kind of all tie for a second. I never know which one to put above which one. They're all so different. Sorry. Final Fantasy This one VII? is definitely. That was just remade? Yes. That was and just you haven't, remade. And you haven't played that? I I have played the initial remake. I this haven't m- had time to sit down and play the new second part. I'm sorry. Rebirth. I got to tell you what I tell my wife all the time. Are you even a fan? You you call yourself a fan? You haven't even. You're like this is like my top two I, games. You haven't played the remake. So are the you, problem the problem sure? is I want to sit down and like really engross myself in it for a weekend, and I just haven't had a free weekend to sit down and like really dive in because I don't want to just dive in for ten minutes here and there and then finish it in like three months. I want to be able to get in and be like, okay, I have a six hour play eric. session today i'm gonna just dive in eric send send your wife up here <laughs> stay home <laughs> play final fantasy 7 you know she'll hang out with ash <laughs> yes and the puppies i'll play so, video games too or something the, <laughs> but yeah i've been i've been doing rift wars or two it, it is just a wonderful wonderfully in-depth um roguelike style of game it's got lots of really cool spell mechanics it, it's super fun if you like this style of game you will know just by looking at the the some of the screenshots whether you like it or not honestly it's very much a 90s early 2000s roguelike it was made with just a quality above ascii art but with that said on the notion of roguelikes bro oh unfortunately you're probably not going to see this before the cell is over maybe i'll even cut in a short of this early so that people can notice it but crypt of the necker dancer is on sale right now for like two dollars and it is possibly one of the best roguelikes that has ever been made it is a roguelike that's 
also combined with a music I hate it. beat game, it is so much it's fun. Really when it's you really get good. into the flow of doing this, it's so amazing because it does all of the mechanics from something like Rift Wizard 2, except that you have to do it to the beat. Because if you're off beat, you lose your combos. So you have to be like, with the music moving around and everything has different combat uh, abilities oh. based on the music. Yeah. It I'm is sorry. one of the most novel and unique experiences in a roguelike, if not the most novel one, and is just unbelievably fun once you get into it. Play with and your own MP3s. What? Yeah, you can play with your own yeah. music and do it to the beat with whatever music you want. You don't have to use the game music. And they are in early access for their new DLC this that they're going to be releasing insane. soon. They added a lot more. I Dude, have to the Necrodancer. they added so much. And so while uh, I, you know, you might not enjoy this style of game, but if you do, for $3, this is insane value. This is like 80 hours of enjoyment if you do like this style of game. Oh, somebody's audio is going. I've been doing this for how long? And this is the first time audio is turned on <laughs> like that. Oh, man. <laughs> I was not ready for that. And I was hoping y'all didn't get that. But while oh, I'm man, interrupting, uh, you reminded me that another thing that we don't have to get into, but that intrigues me <laughs> about Ashes of Creation is that things like spell casters and whatnot are all supposed to be skill based and not just stand from afar and push a button. Yeah. Okay. Which gives me hope. I don't know enough about it. But anyways, Crypt of the Necrodancer. Yeah. Uh, so th if you are into this style of game, you need to play this. It's the best one there is, I think. It is the most interactive one. And the fact that, like, I kid you not. Dude. When you, <laughs> when you are playing Crypt of the Necrodancer. And Necromedanza. <laughs> yeah. And you're vibing out to the music and dodging enemies and hitting enemies and going back and forth, weaving perfectly with their abilities to the music. It is cerebral how cool, cool. that feels. Base like, game is two is three dollars, but for all the packs, it's another thirty. Well, is, all of the is, packs includes like the soundtracks. You can actually yeah, nice. get don't get the soundtracks, and I think it's like seven or eight dollars for everything or something like that oh i see yeah you can Guys. buy them individually and it's like negligible yeah. is no. this 2d beat saber yes dude it feet it really does it because everything's to the beat man it is so cool and every enemy has a different attack pattern based on the beat mm -hmm. that's really cool I've it, it is anything like that it is so cool. It's such an interesting experience. And Obviously, so wait, yeah, I ran crazy. into so many roadblocks with this game. I played oh, it a lot, and I could, it's only I just, three dollars. I couldn't get. That's I what I'm saying, Anthony. It's only three dollars. Like, like for uh, three dollars, this is insane. It's one of the best rogue like games that has ever been made. It is one of the coolest musical experiences on the market. And you can play it with a DDR pad. What? Okay, two things. In case anybody saw, in case Eric put it on screen, I'm buying this on Steam right now. Uh, I didn't give up on it. It's just I'm not signed in on the browser. Also, Eric gave me a DDR pad when we were like teenagers that he used to use. Do you still <laughs> have that? My family might. I don't know. They hold on to stuff. <laughs> Oh, I don't man. have it, but I thought it was really cool. He had like a DDR pad that plugged into like the PlayStation 2 or something and he couldn't use it anymore, so he gave it to yeah. me. I can't remember. I couldn't right. use it at an apartment in Boston oh, on the so third floor. You probably should just get it with the pack because if you buy them individually with the Synchrony expansion and everything, it's going to be... Are like you recommending the Ultimate Pack? The Ultimate Pack is probably your best bet. 
So instead of spending three dollars, I should spend twenty four dollars. Yeah, because you get the game, you get less synchrony, the, you get less amplified. Things, you get amplified, you get synchrony, and you get uh, Hatsune Miku. What does yeah. this even mean? They're um so guys. They I must tell you, me and the audience, three dollars easy. Now you want me to spend nine times that? Well, not nine. I times. I don't understand. If you do amplified in synchrony, which are the only two that I think are necessary, plus the base the game. Soundtracks? The, I don't think you need the extra soundtracks. If you do Crypt of the Necrodancer, the base game, three dollars. Then you do synchrony, five dollars. Okay. Then you do amplified, three dollars fifty cents. You are paying like twelve, thirteen dollars essentially mm. for 80 plus hours of some of the best music slash roguelike on the market okay see now nat that eric has walked me up to 12 dollars nat your idea is more compelling <laughs> <laughs> like well i'm already paying half Why that might paying as well get everything 20, 12 dollars and just pay another twelve dollars and have everything so you don't have to worry about it. Eric, you're right you're right I, but hey i'm nat, stepping I'm, stones hey nat i'm just gonna put it out there i bought the ultimate pack so i'm with you okay Cause, cause <laughs> you know what makes sense to you know what so, this situation is just is, is sprinkling a little fairy dust on something terrible i have 19 dollars and 20 cents in my steam account because of a game that i had a refund that we recently talked about and oh i don't want to think gosh. about because it, it makes me cry yeah, it's that's a sad, sad life right there. What was the sad? Was but yeah, so tribes before the, three. <laughs> yeah, tribes three. Oh, buddy. So like before the stream, I went back and I played some Crypt of the Necrodancer because I I was excited to try out some of the synchrony stuff, and it is just so, so good. I I, I can't recommend that enough. Uh, I like, it's just amazing. And of course, Danny. Um, I always forget his last name. Uh, Danny Phantom. Baranowski. He's Danny Baranowski is, is one of the Phantom. best game composers there is. So the music for Crypt of the Necrodancer is phenomenal. If you don't like this style of game, is that I recommend the soundtrack. <laughs> I think that's Sorry. him right there. Right as yeah. you were talking about it, they show up on screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That was perfect. That's Y'all. That's sick, man. Uh, that's great. I now have one thing to go ahead and cap this all off. Wild Frost is now on I, uh, on your phone. Oh, what is Wild Frost? Wild Frost it's a it's very very phenomenal as a deck single game. player experience deck yeah. building I'm RPG right type now. of thing. I wish it were better as a co op experience. It's just not. Yeah. It's not a co-op experience. It's, so, it's like it's if you have time to just waste the day. Yeah. And right now I'm in a unique situation where my day can be wasted until I get out of this job. So <laughs> I might be playing a ton of Wild Frost in the next few days. That's on Steam, now, right? Yeah, it is on, yeah, Steam. It's on Steam. It's a it's a little deck builder. I played a crap ton of it and I got really into it. Game's hard, dude. Be very yeah. careful. I don't know if they made it easier because I know that that was one of the patch notes. They were like, they were like, okay, we may have overtooled the system. We're so sorry about that. <laughs> have you been able to play? And I haven't gotten to play it yet, but I've been wanting to play it. What's Inkbound. That? No. I I want to try out Inkbound. It's a a deck builder. Inkbound. Hmm. RPG story guys- type of deal. <laughs> Can't keep up with you guys. Got it. And it's a co-op. You can play it co-op. Oh, is this wow, coming through good for you guys, yet. or is it is it jittery? It's not out. It's yet. a little jittery, but I think it'll be smooth if we put it onto a shorter on the playback. Yeah, I might be saving Eric cool. tons of hours of trying to go and find stuff for the shorts. It does look good. I think I've, I yeah. remember seeing this on like a stream or something. Yeah, a bunch of people were playing it a few weeks ago. Yeah. It's still in early access, but it looks really, really cool. I've been wanting... I've heard it's re- great for co-op. I know. 
definitely love to do a tap haven plays of it it's something yeah. i'm really surprised wasn't brought up is that if i recall correctly hell divers is developed by the same people that made magicka and i am Arrowhead? shocked yeah. that yeah. eric didn't tell us that I honestly thought you knew when we talked about the original I, Helldivers. I probably, I might have known, but I'm so surprised that you weren't like, bro, it's Magicka. Because like, yeah. like 10 years ago, Magicka was like, Eric was like, we got to play, we got to play, we got to play. We're playing this game. We were playing this game and then we killed each other. Magicka is one of the best co-op experiences He's the best. ever. Oh yeah. And like no game tries to do magic like magicka where you're like act i mean there are games that do it but like you know the popular games you're doing a bit you're doing mm -hmm. a lot to be uh, to be fair you're doing a lot with magicka you're um, you're doing a lot but it, yeah i mean but it's in a good way but like at the it's same like time, memorizing it's... your hell divers stratagems and having all of them potentially yep. available but but not picking them and then being told how to summon them right yes if i remember also, right also in a way where like the the actual utilization and uh use of it in the game will get you killed like five times out of ten because your spell does not work the, the your ultimate spell that spell right there your ultimate spell does not work every single time you do it it should be important to note, too, there's a bunch of discrepancy between Magicka 1 and Magicka 2 because they are done by different developers. I think do this dope. Um, I believe they just have the same publisher. I think Paradox publishes both of them. But they have different developers, so they feel very different. Magicka 1 and Magicka 2 feel like very different games. True. And unfortunately, Magicka 1, in my opinion, is a little bit more interesting but is buggy as all get out. Magicka 2 plays like absolute butter, but is missing some of the nuance and Magic creativeness that the original has. So uh, it's kind of rough yeah. nowadays, yeah. but both of them are fun uh, uh, novel games. Both of them you know, are novel. I never played Magicka 2. Really? Mm. Yeah, I only have Magicka 1. In my oh, Steam wow. Mm. We might have to play that sometime. Yeah, I'd be down to I'd be down to play Magicka 2 again. I, I mean... Have they been played? It, it is different than the first Magicka. I think it ha it doesn't quite have the level of charm. Yeah, but the, still the, the art style even looks so different to me. Just yeah. looking at these two. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very much so. Mm. Gentlemen. Yeah. Lady. Well, I I think with that said, we have now we can now cap off the longest episode of Tap Haven we've ever done. Uh I don't know how many people will make it to this point, but you know, for our ad segment, we might actually have something, not quite an ad, but we are using Riverside for our new editing tool and I think there will be a little bit of an affiliate link down in the doobly-doo when I, when I put this. If you like what this looks like, which I don't know what it'll look like yet because I haven't edited a Riverside one yet, so we'll see how that looks. But if you do like how it looks, use the thing in the comment below. We, we get a little bit of kickback from that if you, if you use it, if you want to support the stream. There will also be a Patreon link down the below. I do have a Patreon link up. I probably won't actually have like any subscribe. We don't have anything special there yet. Someday we will. Uh, but I do believe it has like a tip thing. If anybody is inclined, don't, picks, don't tip dog. us yet. That's yeah. Don't, yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Oh my God. Weird. Also, please, please. Um, I don't know what the word is, but recognize witness. I just wa I just rewatched uh, Mad that Mad Max. Yeah. Um, Please witness how brave our fearless leader Eric is in this being like the third Riverside episode and he hasn't started editing Gosh, in Riverside yet. <laughs> so he's committed and it might be terrible. We don't know. It, it might be Here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Actually, I've, I've already looked at some of the footage. It's going to look so much prettier. 
Okay. I hope it sounds better because I sound terrible in some it, it will sound it, it your audio does sound way better too. The Discord audio is terrible. Look, we we're moving up in the world, guys. It's just getting more and more more better, yeah. guys. That's all it is. Yeah. And hopefully also, I'm I'm able to save some time by doing those screen shares for you. Yeah, Cause it, no, cause I know. Eric was like so going cool. out of his way to play the games to get like the uh Cult Content, of the Lamb yeah. con recordings yep. and stuff like that hey i'm in it i'm in it for the long haul guys but make sure to uh subscribe and check out uh anthony's channel at at yeah. borderman on all the sites Plus, everything yeah Mostly just start YouTube, looking youtube at shorts uh, you check a lot out, of us playing uh, the games we, for anybody who doesn't know we have tiktok and we have youtube and we have spotify eh, do whatever like subscribe have fun uh, and we'll catch you in the next one. See ya. Bye, y'all. Peace.